Hey friends, welcome back to Deep Dive. In this episode, I am doing a conversation with Oliver Berkman. Oliver is the author of the incredibly, really, genuinely really good book, 4,000 Weeks, Time and How to Use It. The book is in fact so good that Darren Brown said, I loved this book. And Mark Manson, the famous author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck said, wonderfully honest, a much needed reality check on our culture's crazy assumptions around work, productivity, and living a meaningful life. This is a really good book. It's kind of like a productivity book, but it's not really a productivity book. It's more like a philosophical existential look at like the finitude of existence and how we're all gonna die and how like the whole productivity guru culture stuff is maybe not the appropriate way to live a meaningful life. So yeah, really wide ranging conversation. Um, Oliver used to be a journal, or I think still is a journalist at The Guardian, where for 10 years he wrote their column, which was called This Column Will Change Your Life. And he talks about how it started off as a bit of satire, like poking fun at all these productivity gurus. But then what he found as he was doing this is that some of the productivity guru life advice was actually kind of useful. And then it kind of became more of a sincere thing. But now he's written this book and it's actually sick. The thing I love about Oliver is that he's, it's a very like British approach to the idea of productivity and living a meaningful life. And you know, my uh, our American listeners will hopefully forgive me for <laughs> making the, the, the distinction between like a very American approach to like hustle and productivity versus a bit more of a, kind of low-key chilled out British vibe where it's like hey we're all gonna die let's not take things too seriously um that kind of stuff so definitely check the book out links are going to be in the video description and in the show notes depending on whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on a podcast platform of your choice and I hope you enjoy this conversation between me and Oliver Berkman Oliver welcome welcome to the podcast welcome to the program welcome to the show I, I haven't quite figured out what the terminology for because <laughs> like radio 4 it's welcome to the program mm -hmm. American podcast is welcome to the show what yep. do you what do you think sounds more legit ah uh, yeah I th I think show is more common now right but yeah. if it's program you've got to be spelling it um with, with an M -M -E. M -M -E, of course yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna you know, bastardize the spelling of it. Um, thank you for coming on. Uh, we, we are both considered productivity gurus on the internet and broadly. Uh, and I, I, I was intrigued by how, 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 how do you feel about that? Uneasy. Hmm. Um, is, is that even, I suppose I must be, I know you are. I'm very uneasy um, about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you are considered one. I don't, oh. I, I, I suppose. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's a strange, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Cause you're sort of Apart from anything else, you're kind of, um, if, if you spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff and practicing it and putting it into practice, you you run up against its limitations and its edges and you sort of yeah. see past it. So it always feels like you're kind of, anything that you've sort of put out into the world is always like one step behind what you're trying, where your yeah. thinking is at. Yeah, I know it. what you mean. I've got thoughts on this, but for, like, how 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 did you become a productivity guru? What was the <laughs> what was the path to get here? <laughs> totally accidentally. No, I mean, I guess the main thing that I've done in this area is is writing this for a long time. Was writing this column for the Guardian, which started off like literally. Oh, so I did it for more than a decade, and it, and it started off as. Um, basically just uh, mocking self-help, really. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. my, my main motive at the beginning, and we called it, this column will change your life. And that was meant to be a joke. And I spent the ne next like decade of my life explaining to people that it was meant to be sardonic. And, um, and it started off mainly about like looking at the sort of, mainly the nonsense that was that was in the sector with a few little gems here and there i'm afraid it was a kind of a, a, a the journey was one of becoming more sincere really because i suddenly sort of it became more interesting to me especially with the sort of imagined and i think real guardian audience of similarly skeptical people mm. became more interesting to say not look at these charlatan gurus who are being ridiculous but like look at this thing that you might think is a bit embarrassing this topic or this book or this person, there's actually something really valuable hiding in that. That's just a, actually a much more interesting and frankly, journalistically sustainable thing to do in a column is to sort of point to valuable things instead yeah. of just tear down. No, sure. how, 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 how did you get the gig? How, do, how does one become the productivity columnist at The Guardian? I was uh, totally by accident. I was, I was working as a feature writer there and I carried on working as a feature writer there. And my editor on Weekend Magazine at the time saw that I was consuming lots of these books out yeah. with this kind of, definitely with this kind of dual motive of like, well, this is silly, but I'm actually kind of yeah. really interested. And, and she thought, might as well get some, some journalistic value out of the fact that Oliver has this yeah. fixation. So that's how that started. And it wasn't intended to last particularly long, but it, but it ended up doing. And it lasted for 10 years? More than 10 years, I think. Is this, is this still going? No. I stopped it a um, bit over a year ago. Why did you stop? Now. Just, it just totally seemed like it, I, it was 
finally the right time to do so. It was in the run-up to the this book coming out. That weird thing where you want to do new things, but you feel like you're actually not going to be able to motivate yourself to do them until you've cut the cord of the oh, last thing. Yeah. Which I don't want to do. I'd far rather get like get all my ducks in a row and make mm. a make a natural uh, stress free transition. But I don't think you can do that. So that was why as well. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, I mean, so the book that you've written is very very good. Uh, I listened to it on audiobook, but we have a physical version, which I would love for you to sign afterwards. Sure. Um, 4,000 weeks, time and how to use it. Uh, you've got, oh, thingy from Darren Brown. Uh, Darren Brown is one of my, one of my dream, dream podcast guests. Have you, have, have you read his book, Happy? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. it's great. <laughs> and I've, I've got, but haven't yet read his new one. Oh, the um, notes on. About a stubborn universe. I can't remember the details, but it's um, of the title, but it looks... Like yes, totally up my street. Yes, I pre I pre ordered it. It's going to arrive on Kindle at some point, <laughs> at some point soon. I hope. Um, Four thousand weeks. What is like? What's the what's the premise? What's the deal with that? The title uh, that is very approximately the average lifespan in the West expressed in weeks. If you live to be eighty, you'll have what had four thousand one hundred something. I'm, mm. I'm not good at math. I definitely sort of rounded it to a <laughs> to an imposing number, and. You know, I, I, I'm sort of at pains to point out, talking about the title, obviously many people get quite a few more than 4,000 weeks and obviously many people get far fewer. Yeah. The point is just, it's really finite and something about expressing it in weeks makes it really finite. If, even if you like, if you break the current world record for longevity and live to be like what, 125 or whatever you need to do, um, still only is like, six seven thousand or something it's like or something around that yeah. point is it's just you put it in weeks it's just like weirdly tiny so what's the the, the subtitle is is time and how to use it and i guess when when i was like describing this book because i've i i recommended it in my newsletter a few weeks ago after i listened to the audiobook and i was like it's sort of like a productivity book but it's sort of not really a productivity book and it's sort of like a philosophical mm -hmm. exploration of the finitude of existence and i found myself using this weird like terminology <laughs> how how would you describe what the, what the book's about that seems good enough to me i mean it's really strange as the writer of something like this like i i, I don't think first of all like now i'm going to pick a genre and then write into it i definitely think well, firstly, what needs to be said, but more in a way, like, what's, what do I need to hear? Like, because it, it's totally, like, written for me to figure out what I need to do with regard to time as much as it is to sort of lecture other people about that. And I think that the point you're making there about it maybe being an uneasy fit in different genres yeah. reflects the fact that I had got to a point where what I wanted as much as anything else was to understand the, the right kind of perspective to take not as opposed to tips and techniques, not that they're not valuable, but that they have to sort of be fitted into a broader like sense of what it is to, yeah. to have a relationship with time. And then as, as opposed to thinking that the, the one next technique was going to like be my salvation, which I spent yeah. many, many years thinking it would so, be. So in your 10 years as a, as a columnist for The Guardian doing this stuff, were you, I, I got the impression you were like testing different productivity techniques and then you'd write about the effect that they had on your life. Yeah, that was one of the things. It was also like writing about new research and new books and stuff. Okay. But yeah, that was a big part of it. And so I guess, how, how did how did that culminate in this sort of more kind of take a step back, more like, again, like, like relationship to timey approach to a book, rather than, for example, writing a book with like 18,000 tips and tricks? The column was a really useful like experimental ground for like trying things out. And then if you look in like in the rearview mirror, after you've written the column for a few years, I could see patterns emerging things that things that kept making sense to me and all that kept really not working and so both for this book and the last one i wrote like was sort of arose from that process you get to sort of test stuff out you get feedback from people someone says i read your column have you seen this book that's about it and you sort of it acts as a i mean this kind of interaction is much more normal now than it was in the when i began this column which is yeah. still relatively speaking the early days of of the internet for for mm. for newspapers relatively um but yeah so that was that was that way of that that was how it sort of it sort of started and yeah i guess in terms of the substance of the i the idea that that kept emerging from all of that is there is something to do with acknowledging limitations embracing mm. the sort of certain facts 
uncomfortable facts about the human situation with respect to time that that are that is very important if you're going to actually sort of plunge into life and do meaningfully productive things and then there's a, quite a lot of sort of unhelpful ways of thinking about time and productivity including in certain books and coming from certain gurus that basically just sets you up as being in a war with the nat the human situation in a way that is basically never going to help because if your goal is to try to escape your finitude then yeah. um, good luck with that so what do kind of the if if we st stereotype a i don't know a, a, the the stereotypical productivity book written by productivity guru mm -hmm. what does that get wrong or sort of misguided or different about product like how do you how do you think about productivity different to that well i think the yeah that's the right question i think well the most the most stereotypical book is going to imply that you can get everything done that is important to you yeah. whether it's ambitions and goals or sort of obligations and demands all of it provided that you render yourself sufficiently optimized and efficient yeah. and uh, so that you can sort of pack in uh, more and more and more into the same amount of time using techniques you know using specific organizational and and work techniques that you won't need to make tough choices with what you do about your time and that if and that and that you can sort of achieve a kind of control over your day that is basically absolute and over your life and mm -hmm. how things how things unfold in your life that is basically absolute you get a sort of subsection of this stereotypical bad time management stuff that says no you do have to make choices and you have to prioritize but it still implies that like prioritization and saying no and all the rest of it is, is just a matter of getting rid of all the tedious things yeah so that all the things that matter mm. you have time for and i kind of want to say no you don't even have time for all the things that matter actually <laughs> we're going to take a very quick break to introduce our sponsor brilliant brilliant is a fantastic online platform for learning maths science and computer science with interactive and engaging courses that i've been using for many years but to be honest i wish i'd had the lessons in maths to hand when i was preparing for my bmat when applying to medical school a lot of the time when we're taught maths at school the focus is on empty memorization of formulas that we can apply in our exams but the great thing about brilliant is their courses teach you how to actually understand concepts from a first principles approach and develop the intuition to solve problems also their computer science series is absolutely sick. They've got some fantastic courses on algorithms, on learning to program with Python. They've got a whole series about cryptocurrency and understanding exactly how things like Bitcoin work from the ground up, which is genuinely fascinating. So if you want to give their lessons in maths a try, or even science or computer science, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive. And the first 200 people to sign up by that link will get 20% off the annual subscription to the website. So thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring this episode. One of, so one of the things that really resonated with me was the way you described the rocks analogy. <laughs> I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Talking of stereotypical bad time management. I mean, OK, I feel like a caveat. One or two people have explained to me since the book came out ways in which it's possible to interpret this parallel parable that are <laughs> that are not so ridiculous. But in case anyone doesn't know about it, it's a, in various different versions, but it's like the teacher or somebody like brings in a jar of should I go through this whole thing or is it so well known that this is a waste of uh, valuable? I think it's worth going pushes? through. I'm not sure it's that. I, I, it's, it's, it's well known to, to people like you and me. <laughs> okay, just very quickly and you yeah. decide whether to use it or not. A teacher brings a glass jar into a classroom with um, some large rocks, some pebbles and some sand and challenges the students to fit all of this into the glass jar. And then the students, because they're apparently like really dumb, start putting the, the sand in first and the pebbles in first and then they find the big rocks won't fit. So then the teacher says, no, 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 let me show you how to do it. And he says, so you put the big rocks in first, then you can fit the pebbles and then pour the sand in and it all fits. And the idea is um, if the big rocks are your major priorities in life, you've got to make time for those and you can make time for those. And if you do make time for those, then everything else you can fit in around the edges. But mm. if you don't put those first, you'll never get around to them at all. And I don't think that's a completely meritless point. I just want to say that <laughs> yeah. right now so that, you know, the estate of Stephen Covey doesn't no, come and sure. uh, uh, sue me. <laughs> like sues but, you for libel or slander. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but the experiment is plainly rigged, right? It's set up, the, the, the professor, the teacher has only brought as many big rocks in as he knows can ultimately with the right configuration be made to fit. And I think that extending this metaphor the, the, the problem most of us have with time management these days, the main one, it, it's not necessarily that we're bad at prioritizing. It's just that there are too many big rocks to mm. fit in the jar. In other words, there are too many things that totally legitimately have a claim on your time. 
too many people in your life, business opportunities, demands from the boss, whatever you're setting it, whatever your situation is. Like there are just too many things that legitimately you could use your time on than you have the time and stamina yeah. available for. So the nature of the hard choice involved is different. It's not just like, how am I going to organize my day? It's like, what am I going to neglect? Because I'm, and what, what important things am I going to neglect? Because I am definitely going to be neglecting some important things. Yeah, like, so as I was listening to the book, it, it really gave me a lot of reassurance. <laughs> um, because... Again, as a productivity guru, I feel like I should have my life in order. (laughs) And, you know, when the WhatsApp messages pile up to like, you know, 100 plus, I'm like, oh, my God, relationships are the most important thing in life. I'm letting people down by not replying to them. And then I spend hours replying to all the people and then responding to WhatsApp messages uh, generates more WhatsApp messages. (laughs) Similarly to responding to emails, just generates more emails. Yeah. and, you know, at the same time, I care about the work stuff. I care about like, I don't know, some sort of impact. I care about spending time with my family. And it's like in the past, part of me was just like, you know what? I just really suck at keeping in touch with friends and that's okay. And then another part of me was like, no, that shouldn't be okay. Like, you know, I should use my productivity powers to like actually focus on this thing that's important, like keeping in touch with friends. How, how do you, I guess, knowing that, for example, there are too many rocks to fit in the jar. Mm-hmm. How, do, how does one go about sol- quote, solving this problem? Well, I think so the sort of, I think the most important point there is that like in a certain sense, you can't. And that's the really important point. And this is not a despairing message. I think it's a really empowering and sort of thrilling message in a way. (laughs) But like if the if the challenge and like I I I so like vibe with what you're saying there about feeling that there must be a solution Mm. and that all these things really matter. They do really matter. You don't need to persuade yourself that actually some of them don't matter just to get really sort of existential about it i think there is some kind of urge motivating that and it's almost universal to want to find a cheat code for life or find yeah. a sort of you know a caveat in the contract of being no, of being human and and to get on top of everything or in command of your time in a way in a certain way that is just not actually available to us as finite creatures because we have this fundamental mismatch between our capacity to think of infinite possibilities and feel infinite obligations and our ability our finite material you know Mm -hmm. short lives and and limited time so this is like the vague part and we can totally talk about like more specific and practical (laughs) things but but i think there's something really powerful in just seeing oh this isn't a problem to be solved. This is just the way things are. At yeah. the end of life, there will be lots and lots of things you didn't get around to doing that, that totally were legit. That yeah. They would have been good things to do. But that was because you were doing other things, hopefully, things that were, that were good things to do. And you can sort of relax into the discomfort of that a little bit. You can sort of, you can feel the anxiety or anyway, mm. it leads to anxiety in me that comes from thinking like, well, you mean I'm never going to get to this point in my life where I have no problems? <laughs> or feel no no it's like no you're not that and that would be ridiculous and you wouldn't want to get there actually but it's a separate discussion um you can sort of factor in like price in to your to your approach to life that there are going to be good relationships that you don't uh, nurture interesting opportunities that you don't pursue great books that you don't get to to read it's like once that's if something like that is completely a given it stops being stressful like we don't beat ourselves up for not being able to like jump a mile in the air because nobody expects that in the first place <laughs> yeah. of human beings and it's a set it should be the same for this kind of stuff and once you sort of let this whole fantastical edifice crash to the ground and you're just standing in the rubble you can be like okay now i've got this many hours today what would be the most meaningful exciting high impact things to do and it's like it's it's hard and I don't want to imply that I've like totally solved this, mm. this, this, this issue either. But like, I think that is the way forward. Yeah. How did you come to this like realization that in fact, it is not possible to juggle all the things comp- competently? I think the column helped there in like a weird, bad way, because yeah. if you test things out for week after week for many years and you begin to see what it is you're wanting from them, which is basically salvation <laughs> or eternal life or something yeah. equivalent to that. And they, it never happens. And on the hundredth time round, you're like, oh, maybe there's a problem with the framing of this instead of that I haven't just yet found the technique. So that's where being a bit obsessive kind of helps because if you were someone who just tried a couple of time management techniques, you might well imagine that the, um, the, the sort of utopian one, you just hadn't, yeah. you hadn't seen it haven't yet. come across it yet. Whereas I was pretty confident yeah. by the end of that <laughs> decade plus that like it wasn't coming anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's an unusual position to be in where you have actually... <laughs> 
tried all of the technique. Like, I, feel, I feel like I've come close to trying all the big ones through making videos about this for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And I find that every time I reread getting things done, I feel about two weeks worth of like, yes, capture, clarify, organize, reflect, yep. engage. Uh, and, and, you know, it feels like all the cylinders are firing and, and it's all good. And then I miss a weekly review and another one and another <laughs> one. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? I've had this, uh, I, I looked at my Todoist, which was the, the app I was recently trying out. And it's like, overdue reminder, do your weekly review. 24th of October. <laughs> I was like, I did it for two weeks. Yeah. And then the reminder just kept on going over to you. And I was like, I, I know in my head that doing a weekly review is an important thing, getting all my priorities in order, reflecting on the week, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something about it that just actually makes it really hard to do. And uh, Yeah. And I think, you know, I don't want to pretend that I still totally like a new app or a new technique. I'm still like, there's still a big part of me that is like excited by that and I'll try it out yeah. and uh, blah, blah, blah. All that happens. And I'm sure you're in this, um, space too is that you you do begin to just like see through a little bit the motivations that you were bringing to it so it's to do with the spirit in which you adopt a new technique right by all means try out a new technique or go back to getting things done or do anything but like it's when you slightly drop this idea that it's going to like save you yes. <laughs> from the situation and I've actually had this really interesting maybe it's not interesting it's interesting to me experience of trying out certain techniques ages ago finding that they didn't give me what I wanted because what I wanted was sort of this kind of total yeah, mastery <laughs> of time. Yeah, salvation. And then years later, the Pomodoro technique is an interesting example of this, like coming back to it in this new kind of disillusioned, but in a positive way, yeah. um, uh, from that new perspective and seeing like that's actually a really useful thing to do. It's a great, interesting way to divide up the day. It's like totally useful in for what it is. Absolutely great. But I was bringing something weird psychologically to it before. And I think a lot of people do. That's my gamble anyway, that this isn't, isn't just my personal <laughs> hangups and weirdnesses. Have you, have you come across the midwit meme? No. Oh, okay. So I'll, I will describe it to you. And on, on the YouTube video of this podcast, we can put up the midwit meme. It's, it's basically like an IQ bell curve with like 100, 100 IQ in the middle. And it's like on the low IQ end of the spectrum, there's like this dude being like, um, for, for example, something like, I just do what I feel like doing. On the other end of the spectrum, IQ 150, there's a Jedi master who says, I just do what I feel like doing. And in the middle, yeah. the, there is the person being like, I manage my time using getting things done. I have a to-do list. I do my weekly review, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All this kind of stuff. And I think this so much applies in the world of, uh, in, in actually almost, almost anything. Whereas like, in, in a way, by going through the process of becoming a productivity guru, you come out on the other end with a, just a more of an appreciation of like, actually, keeping things simple is potentially yeah. the way forward <laughs> but it's the is this thorough or something but it, it's the simplicity on the far side of complexity right i think you yeah. have to to some degree you have to go through that middle bit and mm. maybe one way of thinking of this book is my attempt to take readers who haven't gone through that through yeah. the sort of the sort of thing no it's interesting and one one facet of that just one particular way that plays out i think is in this idea of like what if you been very helpful for me in the terms of productivity but i think it applies in other areas what if you just sort of what if you gave up the idea that you that there wasn't going to be any single ultimate uh, solution here like what if you just sort of accepted that your techniques and approaches mm. were probably going to like change and evolve all the way through your life like you were never going to kind of get the set of techniques and approaches and apps that i mean and that's kind of obvious in a way that that's what how it's going to be but there is that bit in the back of your mind that's like for some reason, this particular new do everything notes app is somehow yeah. like in yeah. 40 years time is still going to be the market leader. It's like <laughs> I've, I've had that similar sort of journey in a bunch of other sort of productivity adjacent things like in, in the process of writing the book. I have read loads of books about note taking and about the process of writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> and so like Ryan Holiday has a method that, you know, with the physical note cards and this is Zettelkasten method, yep. you know, all of, all of these various methods for, for note taking. And I've kind of just landed on Apple notes, just writing things down as like I read them and that resonate with me. And that's kind of what I was doing 10 years ago as well. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's an evident rather than like that. <laughs> but then through this whole process, it's like, but, but I still feel that there is something out there and that if I if I did have the perfect Zettelkasten method where all my notes would link up and all the insights and then generating a book would be as simple as copying and pasting stuff that I've right. already written over 10 years. Right. Um, given that you've been writing for 10 plus years and have written two books, does that like resonate at all? Yeah, no, it really does. And I mean, one of the things that I found, so there's a, there's a quest for perfect order 
in that in that kind of approach to notes note taking information which is clearly i think one part of this overall quest for like total control over yeah. the human situation you know it's like and it all comes down to like you know not wanting to die ultimately i was sort of seeing this until i and then i after that after i'd begun to stumble on it in my own mind i saw it expressed very well by uh david perel hmm. that these systems kind of you kind of need to keep them messy in a way and to the extent that my system of note taking and storage of notes is is disorganized a little bit and it and it is disorganized like that seems to keep it juicier like i get more interesting insights and it feels like there's more potential there for new chapters or email mm. newsletters or whatever it is when you actually get close to achieving the level of total control you think you crave and perfect order the life kind of goes out of it a bit oh. for me what do anyway. you mean well like if I've got a kind of perfectly organized database of notes, like tagged or folded away in, a, in an absolute, if I get to that point where it feels completely like it's done, I don't know how else to express it than I just did. Like the life goes out of it. Yeah. The, the juice of the ideas is not so clear. If I've got a kind of directory in some app that has, um, I'm using Ulysses mainly, yeah. but which has like, which is kind of, it's not quite properly ordered. There's, there's, there's kind of notes jostling with other notes that probably should be separated out somehow. Like that's when I see the connections between stuff. Mm -hmm. So like I've never quite managed to get on board with the real canonical Zettelkast and stuff yeah. where you like link everything in a very, in a very clear way, because the links for me seem to come just from the fact that there are two notes next to each other that yeah. I, that are not particularly meant to be there. So yeah, mm. serendipity, I guess. Yeah, like in my in my quest for the, the kind of the perfect system to write the book, uh, I was rereading a lot of um, Austin Kleon stuff around sort of creativity and having like an analog workstation and a digital mm. workstation where the analog workstation, like A3 pads and like notes and bits written on paper. And I that felt it seemed like a very like romantic way of writing a book that, oh, I've got this stuff. And then when I go to my other workstation, then I type things up mm. and I haven't yet tried this. But every, every time I do get an A3 pad out, I find that just like scrolling stuff on, an, on a piece of A3 paper is actually just way better <laughs> than, for example, using a very rigid sort of bullet pointy structure on like Notion or Rome or any other note taking app. I, yeah, and I think the, uh, almost the the more abstract issue here is not su is not the method, but yeah. the fact that any method, however good, and I like I love Austin Kleon stuff, for example. But like the the any method, if you take it from that person, and it's like now I must perfectly reproduce it in yeah. my own life. It's gonna you're gonna give it a rigidity that it almost certainly doesn't have in the in the in the world of the person yeah. like <laughs> um, who originated it. And so uh, I'm constantly changing. The yeah. supposed process that I have for doing these things. And I kind of feel like I'm always going to be that way. And there might be something good about the fact that yes. that's how it is. I, I really like that. Like I get so many questions, like, you know, being a, you know, as you know, being a productivity guru, uh, one is somewhat financially and otherwise motivated to continue to try out different apps and mm -hmm. to f find the best one. And part of that is this thing of maybe there is that perfect app around the corner, but like, uh, and another part of it as well, kind of need content for my newsletter, for my <laughs> right, YouTube channel. Right. So, you know, Notion have just released a new feature. Let's like see if it fits into my life. And people will often discover a video I made two years ago where I talked about how at the time I was using Notion to store a list of database for all the things that I've ever read. Yeah. Being like, oh, you know, I was reading your, I was, I was watching your video about the resonance calendar. How, you know, how do you specifically deal with this content type? And I'm like, Pfft. Oh, moved on from that <laughs> three days after I made that video. Right. <laughs> but it right. feels a little bit fake to be that person. Yeah. Um, and so when I was reading this stuff, I was like, I, I, I really got a lot of um, reassurance from it. I'm glad. There's, it's it's reminding me of a thing. I mean, this is making it a bit more sort of like, this is more to do with personal life and relationships perhaps, but there's a great a quote in the book, a psychotherapist called Bruce Tift, who elsewhere, not in the quotes in the book, has this kind of idea that like, what if you took the thing you struggled with the most in your psychological life and just kind of imagined never being rid of it to the end of your days? Like, so if you're like, if you've got social anxiety or you're a bit commitment phobic when it comes to relationships or you're, or you're always struggling to try to bring order to your, to your productivity in your work, like, what if you just thought about the, the prospect of like never being shot of this, of this particular idiosyncrasy. Mm. And at first I feel like, oh, like crestfallen when I do that. Cause I'm like, you mean like I'm never gonna get to the, the perfect time? But then I'm like, oh, actually it's really liberating. It's yeah. actually really liberating to think like, okay, you don't, maybe we're not in the business here of, of finding a way to like suddenly become, to justify our existence on the planet. Maybe that's taken care of. Maybe, yeah. it's, maybe you're <laughs> fine. And then if you, 
come up with some adjustments to your workflow that make you even better, great. Nice. But like maybe you're not trying to like maybe there isn't some like big existential problem here that your that your notes are in disarray. In the book you talk about this and you know in the, in this conversation so far you've alluded to that kind of something along the lines of the the desire for productivity and control is is ultimately a desire for salvation a fear of death like what 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 do you, what do you mean by that? Well this is where it gets so sort of hard to put into words but I think we I think m- most of us today and I talk in the book about how I don't think this would have been true for like medieval peasants yeah. and <laughs> some other people but like we think of time as something that we're like in a relationship with and there are that's not a given um through the history of reflections on time but like and so it naturally becomes something that we've got to try to sort of use well, or we could be guilty of wasting, or we want to sort of feel confident that the near future is going to unfold in a certain way. And actually, time isn't really like this. So we don't have, it's not, it, we're, we're treating it as something that ultimately it, it isn't because you don't really have time. You just get given each moment as it comes and you don't know how more, much more of it you'll have and you can't really put it aside. All those things that sort of the language and the metaphor of, like yeah. physical possessions or like money ownership or and management right, and stuff right, like right. yeah doesn't quite work um the blogger david kane has done some really uh, raptitude oh some really, yes some really interesting stuff on this it's like so you're constantly approaching your time with a sort of set of concepts that aren't quite properly suited to what it really is and i think that's because it's kind of uncomfortable and ultimately if you go deep enough probably quite terrifying to sort of face up to the real truth of the situation which is that each of us all the time is just completely vulnerable to anything that might happen next. Like you have no control over the future. You can exert influence and improve probabilities, but like Mm. you are just on this raft, on this um, white water river being borne forward. um, And you've just got to sort of do what you can in that situation. And in that context, it's really tempting to feel like, no, can't I come up with a way where I'm like, you know, the met- stretch the metaphor, but like where I can like get onto the riverbank and then like control a fleet of ships or something. Like, no, you're just like, you're just in it. And that's terrifying. And so I think a lot of what passes for sort of bad time management, but also lots of other th- sort of weird behaviors that we engage in in life are basically forms of emotional avoidance, right? They're ways of not facing up to the, the sort of edgy, nervous, angsty mm. situation that we're actually in. So we, we, we think the, the way forward is to, is to feel more in control than we, than we really are or to distract ourselves. Yeah. And as I say, it's a little bit hard to sort of articulate in, in words, but I think that actually the, the, the better approach in all these contexts is as to the extent that one can, to actually acknowledge the way things mm. really are and to sort of like go with the fact that you're that you're on the raft on the white water and then you can start like navigating a bit more and, and use what influence you you have does that make yes sense the thing that that reminded me of was again to sort of con- concretize it please for do. an <laughs> example from my life where i feel like this really applies it's that the the, the feeling of writer's block in the sense that I sit on my laptop and I've got three hours. I need to do some writing. Ooh, and then there's like, uh, uh, I don't really know what's going on. Um, therefore, the solution is my my note-taking system is just not tuned enough. <laughs> so, uh, so what I need mean, yes. is the perfect note-taking system. <laughs> and yeah. once I have that, then writer's block will disappear. And one of the most like reassuring things about speaking to any author, like I've done on the, on the podcast or listening to interviews and stuff, is that that feeling never goes away. And mm. this is supposed to be hard. And this is the work. And when I kind of internalized that, now when I have that feeling of like, oh, I'm, I'm so bad, like, why would anyone read this, et cetera, et cetera, I think this is fine. All of the people think this, <laughs> so it's all good. And it, just embracing that then, or weirdly, helps me make progress and also be less beating up of myself about the fact that I've only made a thousand words of progress rather than the 2,800 that, and 33 that I had like decided hmm. would lead to a million words a year or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's so that, that observation that like, that, that these things are difficult and you might get lucky sometimes and go into like beautiful flow state, mm. but, but they are basically difficult. Um, it reminds me of the opening line of a great old self-help book, the road less traveled by Scott Peck, mm. which is, I'm paraphrasing, but he starts off saying life is difficult. And then what he, he says something like, this is one of the great truths because when you, um, when you fully internalize the truth that life is difficult, it no longer matters that life is difficult. So it's like, it's like, I feel like that's a different way of saying when you stop treating 
the difficulty of doing difficult things as a problem to be solved, yeah. then they're not, they're less difficult in a certain, in a certain way. And the way I would put that through like my stuff in this book is like what's happening when you're writing is you're being brought up against your limitations and your, your edge, right? You're, you're doing something that matters to you. The stakes are high. You don't know that you can do it to your standards. You don't know that it will be well received, but you want it to be. So mm. all these different things are at stake. And so it, it's, it's unpleasant in a way. And if at that moment you distract yourself with some like nonsense yeah. um, online or wherever, like that's your, your, it's obvious why you would want to do that. You'd want to do that because it's because it, the things are not at stake and it's, <laughs> and, and you're not worried about whether you can, yeah. can do it or not. Another reason I ask is because relationships are allegedly the most important thing in life. And I, I have always thought like maybe there's ways to think more intentionally, more efficiently productively about relationships and also you've had a kid recently which is cool um and i'm always like curious about like i feel my calendar is overloaded already and i don't have a kid mm -hmm. like what the hell do you do when you have a kid <laughs> yeah i don't really know the answer i mean it was only fairly recently now because he's just yeah. turned five which is uh, oh five yeah Been writing no, a book for that long. well <laughs> I, I i i sort of sold the book proposal then he right. came along and then the book was just oh, on hold okay. for like three years and then Got it. Then, then okay. so, so yeah, it was, nothing will uh, mess with your belief that you can uh, control your, your, your time. And I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't want to claim I've figured this out perfectly at all, but I suppose the sort of just think about parenting just for a second, like yeah. the, the one way of thinking about that is it does just sort of show you something very clearly that was true all along, which is that you don't have the control over the time that you thought you did and you don't have the capacity to do everything you were imagining so you know for many years before becoming a parent I might think that I was constantly just like one a week or month away of from of self-discipline and yeah. applying myself to sort of getting everything totally nailed and um, that becomes again it becomes a lot harder to continue to believe in that once like 50% of your previously available time minimum, it depends on the type, stage of parenting, I guess, but like, has just been taken away and put to this, to this um, totally non-negotiable uh, thing instead. And so it's like, that's quite useful in a way. Obviously it's, not, obviously it's not useful from the point of view of one's work to have less time available for one's work, but it is kind of, it, it, it helps one's own like growth in a way, quite apart from the many, many, huge delights of just being father but like it, it helps one's own growth in a way to sort of see the sit see the truth of the situation a bit more plainly which is like you know there's definitely not enough time for everything sacrifices will have to be made um and to some extent this this effect hasn't been as pronounced for me as it has for some people so i'm slightly annoyed at that but to some extent it also um reduces your distractibility in the work time that you do get because you're just like okay it's just a few hours now before I'm back on, you know, before school pickup or whatever. So better get to it. And that does, to some extent, that works for me. I am still prone, a little bit more prone to distraction than, than I would <laughs> like to be. But what are we going to do about that? We are going to take a little quick break from the podcast to introduce the sponsor of this podcast, which is Curiosity Stream. If you haven't heard by now, Curiosity Streams is the world's leading documentary streaming subscription platform founded by John Hendricks, who's the founder of the Discovery Channel. And on Curiosity Stream, they've got hundreds of really high quality, high budget documentaries covering all sorts of things from science and technology to history and ancient civilizations to food and medicine and meditation and like all of the stuff in between. Now, the really cool thing about Curiosity Stream is that they support independent creators. And so there is this service called Nebula, which you might have heard of. It's an independent streaming platform that's run by me and a bunch of other creators. And on Nebula, we can put content like videos and behind the scenes and long form, longer form stuff without worrying about things like the YouTube algorithm. And so for example, on Nebula, I have a bunch of exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else. We actually have the original season zero of the Deep Dive podcast, which started off as like remote Zoom live streams during the pandemic. And that is only available on Nebula. You won't find it anywhere else. So if you enjoy the sorts of conversations we have on Deep Dive, you might like to see, you know, a whole year before we started this podcast, 
properly once the pandemic stopped, what sort of conversations I was having with people on Zoom. I've also got a series of videos on Nebula called Workflow, which is where I deep dive into some of my favorite productivity tools. And on Nebula, you also get early ad-free access to my videos and videos from a bunch of other creators that you might be familiar with, like Thomas Frank and Tom Scott and Legal Eagle and Lindsay Ellis. And the really cool thing is that because Curiosity Stream loves supporting independent creators, we've got a little bundle deal, which is that if you sign up for an account on Curiosity Stream, you actually get free access to Nebula bundled with that. So if you head over to curiositystream.com forward slash deep dive, then for less than $15 a year, you can get full access to Curiosity Stream's incredible library of documentaries and also free access to all of the stuff on Nebula bundled with that. So head over to curiositystream.com forward slash deep dive to get the bundle deal. So thank you, Curiosity Stream, for sponsoring this episode. I always have that feeling of, you know what, from next week or from two weeks from now, when the calendar is broadly empty or, you know, then my life will be sorted mm -hmm. because all these ad hoc thing, things that appeared this week, they're not going to appear two right, weeks from now. Right, right, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And, you, and yeah. you pair that with a tweet I saw the other day, I can't remember who from, saying like, all my schemes for self-improvement depend on my waking up tomorrow with like five times as much self-discipline than I've ever demonstrated on any day of my life right. to date. So it's both of those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we, we were doing a little goal setting, goal setting exercise with the team yesterday. Uh, we had this whole like business coaching session, quarterly planning and stuff. And I was like, you know, what's, what's like my number one priority for the next quarter? And it's to write the first draft of the book. And I was like, okay. And I was like, wait a minute. That's like 12 weeks in a quarter. There's 12 chapters in a book. Shit, that's one chapter a week. <laughs> right, right. A chapter is like, I don't know, like 8,000 words, probably 10,000 that the editors are saying we can cut down to like six or 7,000. So am I really saying I'm gonna write 2,000 words in a day, like each day? And I'm like, well, th three, three hours in the morning, it's quite a long time. How hard can it be? <laughs> and so it's just like, yeah, I will do this thing. But I think it's, it's very much, you know, as we, as we think about our future selves, we give ourselves superpowers. <laughs> yeah. That like, yes, right. I will wake up on time. I'll be fully disciplined. I will go to the gym like before eight o'clock and then I'll be sit, sat there ready with my coffee to write for four hours solid and not get right. distracted and not need to do a poo like in the middle of that. <laughs> yes, yes, right. And the, 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 the reason, I mean, this is maybe obvious, but like there's a lovely quote from Henri Bergson, the philosopher in his book, Time of Free Will, where he sort of says like, there's the reason that thinking about the future in this way is almost always more appealing than facing the present is because like anything's possible in the hypothetical future. Yep. You, the, the limitations of the material world that you're subject to today are not there like in your imagining of next month because you can sort of think like, oh, I'll find a way to do this, 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 and this, or yeah, I'll bring more self-discipline and energy to it than, than, uh, than before. And it's, so it's comforting. You get to like, you, you get to sort of squirrel it away in the future so that you don't need to like face the, mm. face the truth of the situation right now. Mm. Yeah. It's useful Absolutely. to notice when one is doing that, I think. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the balancing act like that, that I found as well in my life without a, a child um, is where I will try my best to set an intention for the day of like, this is the, this is the one thing that I want to do. And I will try my best to broadly stick a time block in the calendar for when I will want to do that one thing. Knowing that, like, to be honest, if a friend was like, hey, do you want to grab lunch? I will prioritize social life over work generally. Um, and the way I think of it is like the rest of the rest of the things I want to do today are a might to do list rather than a to do list. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm still I say ex experimenting, still, still trying to figure out like what is the what's like a realistic maximum number of things like I'm allowed to have on that list mm -hmm. because I think otherwise for me the temptation is there I'd be like oh well I'll call my grandma and then I'll call my mom and then I'll call my aunt and then okay so that's the relationship box take oh then I need to message about eight different friends and I need to send thank you cards and oh Christmas is coming up so let me send great gifts blah 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 and then I need to do all these different things checking all these videos that are coming out and the list just swells um whereas what I've been trying to do recently is just be like I'm only allowed to do three three things on this list and if after that I still have more time and I feel like doing like quick work, then at that point I can, I can freestyle it. But I just never get through just, just even those three things on the list. Um, and one of the things I really liked um, about your sort of like at the end of the book, you have a sort of practical advice section for, mm -hmm. for those of us that are like, okay, I like that, mate. <laughs> Enough philosophy, and we get to the tips. Uh, you talk about um, I think sort of, uh, sort of having, having like a, 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 a maximum number of things that you're allowed to do, something to that effect. Yeah, there's all sorts of different ways of implementing this, and you'll be familiar with many of them. But this idea of like limiting your work in progress, mm. this idea of saying that um, I'm only gonna, this idea of saying like I'm only gonna work on um, a, a small, a, a fixed number of, of things, and I'm going to complete one of those things mm. before I allow myself 
to put another item onto that queue. And obviously you can do this at the level of like projects. You could say, I'm only gonna have like one major goal um, in my work at a time. And you can also do it to some extent at the level of tasks, right? You can be like, well, these are the, these are the three things I'm going to do. And I'm, until I've done one of them, nothing else is coming off that mm. task list. And, uh, you know, Kanban um, boards are an obvious way to implement this. And I've got this idea in the book about keeping two to-do lists where you sort of feed items from an infinite to-do list through a very narrow, limited to-do list. Um, and again, it's just all about like saying, look, you're already making choices. Your time is already finite. Whenever you're doing something, you're already saying no to all the other things in that moment. So now just like make it conscious yeah. and, and, and sort of hold yourself to it and avoid that thing that I certainly am very prone to. I think lots of people are where it feels like you're more in control of things if you just sort of spread your um, attention among 50 of them. Yeah. Uh, but actually it isn't because what, you're not more in control of them. You're not making better progress on them because you just bounce from one to the next whenever they get difficult. So you just yes. go around. And no, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm finding this with a book as well, which uh, one of my... My, my my writing coach says it's normal for a first draft where I will get 80% of the way through and then it starts to feel like Ugh, I need to round off the argument somehow but I can't be bothered right now let me just do chapter 8 right, right, right. <laughs> and I'm hoping that towards the end of it then I'll be able to, to think about this this kind of stuff yeah on, so on the goal on the goal setting front um, I, I also keep on trying to find the perfect system for this like um, in, in, in terms of like, like, like personal goals one of my theories my philosophies, shall we say, is that setting, like, I don't like it when I set goals that are outside of my control. For example, when I set the goal of, I want a YouTube video that hits a certain view count right. compared to, I want to make a video I'm proud of. When I think I want to write a book that hits the Sunday Times bestseller list versus I want to write a book I'm proud of. And that's all fine. But that almost feels like it's, oh, well, I'll just do my best and not worry about the outcome, which also, which feels a little bit unsatisfying given a bunch of research around the idea of like effective goal setting and challenging goal setting and the fact that kind of high performers in inverted commas in most fields you know it's not like michael phelps is just you know what i'll just try my best and see what happens it's like you know <laughs> right 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 yeah so uh, yeah any any thoughts around that tension between i'll try my best versus i have this specific outcome i'm aiming for which maybe is somewhat outside of my control it's interesting i mean i there's a sort of sub distinction there between there's the goal there's the things you can control and things you can't control but then there's specificity or vagueness in the things that you can control and i i do think that like things like doing your best and being proud of things like they're really important values in life but i can see how they're not they're not particularly helpful in this setting because it's sort of completely open-ended mm. and so it's not very smart <laughs> i no, right exactly either you can either you will end up sort of not doing what you could have done because you say well that was my best so i don't care like uh, and you sort of you sort of make it easy for yourself or you do what i think i would do and have done in a lot of my early adulthood which is like be convinced that trying your best is really important and then like torment yourself constantly with like am i doing my best am i do is this my best am i can i do you know and those kind of open-ended things seem unhelpful you on the other hand if you say I mean, this is where I feel like quantity-based goals can be really helpful, right? If you say, like, I'm going to put out this number of videos or this number of, I'm going to write this many words uh, on a, on a, by a certain point. Firstly, it's specific. Secondly, it's within your control. And then thirdly, it's kind of, it's somewhat drained of the sort of, the qualitative goals are sort of, uh, they, they, they go wrong because they're so sort of emotive. There's something kind of nice about a very, very sort of mechanistic yes. goal in that area. I don't think it's the whole piece of the puzzle because I do think, even though I wrote in my first book about like how positive visualization is largely nonsense and all sorts of things, I do think there's clearly a role for kind of envisioning the, having a vision of where you'd like things to be and, and using it to, to determine what you do in the in the present but that idea of just being maybe this is like systems versus goals that it's this, that old distinction but it's like it's like the idea of saying like this many words um or you know just something really sort of that sort of takes out all the yeah. all the all the all the angst from it i think that's nice. be really useful yeah well, well one of the ways i'm thinking about it because i'm i'm i was writing the chapter about this in the book like this week last week um I intended to do this week as well, but then time got in the way. Like, like <laughs> um, is yeah, like systems. Versus, ah, I don't. Know, I feel like I feel like all all of this stuff converges on a few central central themes, and and 
uh, we as productivity writers try to put our own stamp on like a thing which people have been doing for centuries, not millennia. Uh, but that aside, um, what I'm, what I really like is, is that if I kind of break down my implicit process of goal setting, because it's never been like explicit, if I, if I break down what that looked like, what it looked like was step number one, setting a kind of destination goal that is within my control, like write a book I'm proud of, which mm. is like this big product, big project. Um, maybe in my mind, it's like, it would be really cool if it hits a bestseller list. It would be really cool if I get invited on conferences and if I, I don't know, get on a podcast because mm. that, 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 that would be sick. But like, those are outside of my control. So let me just not think about those <laughs> yeah. and just recognize that actually it, it's, a, you know, a preferred indifferent as, as, the, Stoics, as the Stoics might, might say. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so the, the destination goal is within my control. And then I'll break that down into the kind of quote, journey goals, mm -hmm. which are, is more the system stuff. Yeah. Of, therefore, what I like tangibly need to do is that every week or every day, I want to aim to write X thousand words or X hundred yeah. words. And again, that is within my control. And then kind of my step three of this three-step process is for, for that journey goal that like, let's say I want to write 500 words a day to lower the bar of quality as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want like, I, I literally write on my to-do list, write 500 crappy words for crappy first draft of chapter two. And I find that putting the words crappy in there twice <laughs> really <laughs> makes it easier to be, yeah. okay, you know what? This is actually, this is actually doable. Doable. Like, yeah, let, no, let, let's do this. Great. Um, and it makes me think of two other things like um, Dan Harris, the meditation yeah. uh, writer and the podcaster um, talks about doing things specifically meditation, uh, aiming to do them daily-ish and having, nice. like, having this built in, <laughs> built in fuzziness, like, cause you know, whether you did something daily-ish, like mm. in a given week, you, you have a feel like if you did it twice, it wasn't daily-ish, but it, but it reduces this kind of like, oh, if I break my streak, it's all over and I might as well spend the next three weeks not, not doing anything. <laughs> um, so I think that's, a, that's an nice. important part of that. And then something I've found really helpful, I don't know if this is writing specific, but like might be just specific to writing, but it's also like not keeping going even if you're on a roll. So if you say like, I'm gonna write 500 words and you write them and then the things are going well, you're like, I get another 500 out. It's like actually making yourself stop and walk away. Like that kind of enforced low balling of your, of your aims for the day. And like, that's really, I think for people like I suspect you and certainly for me, like that's really hard to do. Yeah. Like when the, when the opportunity for a bit more productivity arises and you, don't take it. Yes. <laughs> but there's this amazing old book that I had to like buy as print on demand because it's because it's so hard to get called um, How Writers Journey to Comfort and Fluency by a psychologist called Robert Boyce. And it's like a really in-depth study of academic writers and what caused them to be either productive or non not productive. Um, I mentioned him in the book a couple mm. of times. And like one of his big findings was that the writers who made writing into a, a, a moderately important part of their lives were, did lots more than the ones who made it into a very important part of their lives because then it becomes this kind of intimidating thing and you have sort of all sorts of angst about it and you forget about it for weeks at a, yeah. a time because you don't dare go back into that scary thing. And part of that is like you figure out what is your short daily session of writing. And he said like, you know, for, people, for sort of amateur writers, that might be 10 minutes a day. Even for professional writers, it probably should never be more than like three or four hours. And when it's up, you just, you have to stop and like yeah. go and do something else because otherwise you're kind of giving in to a, an impatient urge to be done with the whole thing that will ultimately backfire on you and cause you to sort of dread uh, yeah. returning to the project. That ability to keep important things relatively small in your life i think it's like it's mm. really i'm not saying i'm any good at it yeah but it's it's really interesting I, I, I was thinking about this like last night so i i got home from here at like 7 p.m 8 p.m something like that no like it, yeah it was like it was like 8 p.m i was like you know what i'm gonna sleep at 10 30 so i can get a solid like eight hours of sleep wake up at 7 30 like life, life's gonna be good i was like so I've, I've got like two and a half hours now hmm what, what do i do with that time and i said to my housemate i was like right lucia i could do some writing or I could play PlayStation while listening to an audiobook. What should I do? And she was like, well, you know, Ali, you've worked hard to get to this point. Like, why don't you just play PlayStation? <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. And then I had a great session of playing Ratchet and Clank on the PS5 while listening to The Evolution of Desire <laughs> on 3x speed on Audible. And it was so good. I just love the audiobook plus PlayStation experience. Um, and uh, th this reminds me of something. Uh, do you know Gre uh, Greg McEwen? He yeah. Wrote, yeah. I mean, uh, not personally, but yeah. yeah, I really like his stuff. Um, yeah. So his, his newish book, Effortless, mm -hmm. tells the story of like um, two. It's, it's like one of these perfect stories that I don't know. I don't know how like 
100% true it is, but like illustrates the point of like these two expeditions, like the British expedition and the American expedition to the North Pole or something. And the Brits were like, you know, what, or actually probably the Americans <laughs> were like, you know, every single day we're going to make as much progress as we can. And the Brits were like, we're going to go five miles and no more and no less on any day. Yeah. <laughs> and the Americans ended up dying on the expedition and the Brits ended up right. just like slow snail, snail mailing their way to just five. Even, so even when it's good weather, even when it's bad weather, we're not going to bother going above and beyond, mm -hmm. even if we can. And just that, that thing in my mind of 500 words and only 500 words or two hours and only two hours and then stop. And then I'm just not allowed to do any more writing. Right. And yeah, and it's, yes, I think it's great. I think, and, it, and it's hard, right? Because we, just as a culture, and I would suspect especially people who are interested in being productive in that culture, like resting is difficult. Like if I have, it doesn't happen very often, but if I, these days, but if I have like two hours to just do whatever I want and, I, and I've decided that it would be not appropriate to use that to power through my, my work, like that's quite challenging. Mm. It's like I, it, it does not. Ob things do not obviously suggest themselves to me <laughs> in that situation. It's it's better since we moved to the North York Moors because actually going out hiking in nature is an example of that. That sort of holds my attention while clearly being not you know more of the treadmill. Yeah. But like I think people get confused because we've we you hear so much about how important rest is. People know that they need rest. They feel burned out. And then if they ever make it happen in their lives, it makes them feel sort of antsy mm. at first. It's not, and, and so one of the, I actually talk about this in the book, you know, it's like, you've, you've got to be ready, I think, if you, if you want to pursue these different ways of relating to time, for them not to feel totally great in the first like half hour or first day Ooh, of testing yeah. things out. Because, because we are just completely geared to thinking that time not spent productively is time therefore wasted. Um, and so like the, the first half hour that you're sitting by the fire with a novel or the first day that you're at a, on a beach for a week's holiday by the beach probably isn't going to feel great. And actually, it's, if you know that, it's less of a problem because I think yeah. it then, then starts to feel great. You know? Yeah, I, I think one other thing that I, th that I think about on this, on this topic is, you know, you know, this idea of like s stopping work at a, at, a, at a particular time and how it feels like, oh, but I, c I could get more done if I continue to power through. It's just that, like, really is, and again, I'm, I'm bad at doing this, but when I do, I always feel a little surge of satisfaction. Just the idea that, like, what am I actually optimizing for here? Like, yeah. you know, if I think of what I, I, I guess what I want from my life, what I imagine is a life where I'm doing some reading, doing some writing and doing some teaching and hanging out with a team like once a week and maybe filming a video or a podcast. Like, that is probably the life that I'm, I'm, I'm leading. And... Finishing my book any faster and like, I don't know, getting out one extra YouTube video this week and stuff like these things that would be the outcomes of me spending more time working. It's like, wh why? What's the point? Like, who's that for? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, what yeah. is when is enough? What yeah. is enough? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, you know, the, what I what I try and think of is let me sort of enjoy each day on its own merit rather than think of the day as a, I guess, a means to an end of having a particular outcome because like, you know, journey before destination and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's making me, th yeah, it's, it's so true. It's making me think of a time a few months ago when I was hiking in the middle of a weekday with an old friend and a beautiful part of the North York Moors that just had come together that we could do this and being struck by the thought in the middle of this very enjoyable few hours, uh, literally being struck by the thought, I wish I lived the kind of life where I got to do this. Like, I wish I was the sort of person who could just like come and do this regularly. And it's like, <laughs> while I was doing it, right? <laughs> and so the, the sense of like having to become a kind of person who is so in control of stuff that you can dispense your time in these different ways perfectly is so powerful that it can stop you seeing that you're like, you're literally doing it in that yeah. moment. So, I mean, it's not quite the same point you're making, yeah. but it's this idea that like, you've got to become the kind of person who X, well, no, you've just got to do those things a bit. And if things, if you value things, just do them a bit and you're, and that's, that's the whole challenge. So like, I feel like this thing, I'm changing the topic, I guess, but like, I feel this whole thing of like trying to become the kind of person who is actually a really, can often be a Ooh, big, a yeah. big obstacle. It's a mind to, virus. To just, to just do it. Yeah. Uh, are you, so, okay. So there is another 
a cartoon that I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is, you might be familiar with, but we'll, we'll flash it up on the screen and I will describe it for people who are listening on, on audio. It is like a big, ele- like a, an elephant and like a, a baby elephant in a zoo. And um, a kid is there with his dad and the kid points at the little elephant and is like, you know, why, why is there a, like a chain around its leg? And the dad's like, oh, well, you know, the elephant you know, is going to escape. Otherwise, you know, this is how they, how they keep it there. And then the kid looks at the big elephant, at the mum elephant, and says, why is there just a string around her leg? Uh, and the dad's like, well, she's realized that she can't escape uh, or, or something like that. And right. it's like often uh, the, 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 the reason I think of this a lot is that often we chain ourselves with our own assumptions, even though they may, may not entirely be true. And, and last night I was having dinner with Dan, who is my assistant and our, like one of our, well, one of our team members. Um, and I was saying to Dan, you know, I, re- I really wish I could get to the point where I could, I don't know, just go to Bali for a week to do like a writing retreat or something. And he was like, but you can, like yes, you, yes, you absolutely yes, can. Yes. You know, this is, this is your team, this is your business. We know that you can work remotely because we've done it. We know you can take Gordon with you so you can film videos while you're out there if you really need to. But like, you absolutely can. Yeah. And I was like, damn, <clears throat> yeah, you're right. I, I, I just had sort of assumed that I had less control over, over my time, <laughs> control of my time than I actually did. And in a way, it was, in a way, it's comforting, I think, to think I will write my symphony tomorrow. <laughs> um, totally. Once life becomes more blah, 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 blah. And when we face up to the fact that, oh, crap, I actually could just, just do that. Then it's like, oh, hang on. <laughs> there's yeah, some, there's no, something yeah. uneasy about that. No, absolutely. And I think it's important to say, like, obviously, the specific example is not open to everybody. Yeah. Many people aren't in a position to go on a writing retreat to Bali for <laughs> no, a week. Sure. But <laughs> like there is... No, 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 <laughs> yeah. but there is... There is that same equivalent situation. I think we we do it to ourselves all the time. It's it's related to that. Um, it's kind of Jean Paul Sartre and the idea of bad faith, right? This idea yeah. that this idea that like, and it's in Heidegger as well. If you really want to get <laughs> into the weeds of this, like this idea that we that we that we tell ourselves we don't have choices that we do have because it's actually much more scary to sort of face the choices that we do have. And like, no, if you're you. you and you have big people have big like you can people can walk out of relate marriages they can um walk out of jobs they can they can like make pu- kind of the kind of public statements that are going to get them totally cancelled you know that you can do this like the, you, you say you can't do it. what you mean is that the consequences are, of it that you predict are are scary and they may well not be worth it in any given situation um uh, but so, but like these choices are always there. There's a lovely quote from the psychotherapist Sheldon Kopp, who um, has this whole list of life advice in back of one of his books. And the one I always remember is um, you're free to do whatever you want. You have only to face the consequences. Yeah. Right. And and you can I find this incredibly empowering because it's like, no, no, you can do almost anything within the bounds of the laws of physics. And yeah. given my financial and <laughs> temporal resources and some of them would have really, really bad consequences so i definitely wouldn't do them yeah and some of them would have somewhat bad consequences like people being disappointed in me or angry or something and they might totally be worth doing anyway i slightly mm. moved that on i don't know if it's quite no no i agree but, like uh, um a few a few i think it was a few, a few months ago now i was i was i was, I was here on a weekend just because this place was nice and i was in the middle of moving house um and i was really thinking about kind of consequences of things uh in in in, in particular i i was doing a Tim Ferriss's fear setting exercise yeah. on the what's really the worst that could happen where I had this thought that, Ooh, what if I just stopped caring about like the view counts on my YouTube channel and I just like didn't let it affect me at all. What's the worst that would happen? Oh, okay. Let's actually kind of think about this and realize that actually, you know, this is actually probably a good thing overall. And there is very few worst case scenarios here that I, I, I couldn't deal with. But I'd, I'd, I'd spent the last like four years kind of on autopilot, just assuming I had to care about the numbers yeah. and assuming that like how well a video does is some sort of factor that should make me feel more or less good, depending on how, how well the video does. And I think it just like comes back to this thing of often we're operating on these invisible scripts with these invisible shackles where at least at least in my life and in, in, in my experience, like the things that I would want to do are not the things that actually have consequences that I can't handle. It's just where I have made assumptions about, oh, I probably can't do this. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there's a kind of a comfort, as you say, as a comfort, yeah. but also a, there's a sort of a false sense of control in worry, right? There's this idea that like if I, I think the reason that we worry on some level is because we think that we're somehow affecting reality through our worrying. And it's like, mm. well, if I, if I let my hands off the controls there, terrible things might happen. So I'm going to keep like, yeah. I'm going to keep like fretting about it. And the truth is, I think in, it's possibly a, a sort of universal truth or it's mainly just a or it's maybe just generally true that like the terrible things that can happen in life like cataclysmic things can happen in life but they're not part of the they're not in the realm of the things that you might be worrying and controlling about right i mean like absolutely terrible things can happen but they will just be like you'll be blindsided by mm. those and stoicism has some ways to maybe be <laughs> slightly less blindsided but yeah. uh, but but like the things that we worry about we're worrying about because we think that the worry somehow somehow increases our control over them and it just like it just doesn't so you might as well not worry about them easier said than done i think it basically in 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 every aspect of my life from well at least kind of from the time that i remember vividly like uh, sort of end of end of school towards university and beyond i've had like every few months when i come across some article on life hacker about setting your goals and mm -hmm. figuring out what you want and i do like a i don't know visualization thing of like you know, what do I actually want? Like, what does like a, a good day look like and, and stuff? Every, every time I do that, I just come up with stuff that I think, there's no reason why I'm just not doing this now. Um, <laughs> right. Like, you know, I, I, at one point a few months ago, I decided, I, you know, at, at some point I want to get into learning how to write songs. I was like, I've got two hours right now. Like, what's, what's stopping me? Mm. Uh, all right, cool. Let's just follow a tutorial on YouTube and, you know, download GarageBand or something and make a start on writing songs. Um, Similarly, when it came to business stuff, when it came to deciding to get the studio space and building a team in person, I just hadn't really thought about it. I was like, you know, I did one of those exercises where it was like, you know, what does your dream future look like five years from now? I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to, I don't know, have, have a studio or something where I don't have to have cameras and lights everywhere at home and to come in on a Monday. And, you know, this, there's a team there in person just like to brainstorm video ideas about and yeah, interview people in person. And I was like, damn why don't I just do this? Because uh, before the assumption and the, the invisible assumption I've been operating on was that when you, when, you, when you work with a team, they just have to be remote. And when you do a podcast interview, it has to be over Zoom. I think the, the pandemic kind of really contributed to this. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was yeah. just such my, like my model of the world was how, how can you possibly hire someone for an in-person job? And I mentioned this to someone and they were like, dude, do you realize that 99.99% of the workforce is, is in-person rather than remote? Like, Mind blown. <laughs> um, I don't quite know where I was going with this, but uh, yeah, just the, the, this idea of occasionally coming back to this idea of like, what do I actually want? And thinking, what are the assumptions that I'm making that are stopping me from being there? And why don't I just do it right now rather than next quarter or next year? Right. No, yeah. I think that's, it's incredibly powerful. And it just reminds me again of wanting to say, like, I think that it will feel uncomfortable to do that at mm. first, right? Because that, because what you're doing, if you decide to spend two hours doing the thing that you've told yourself you want to do one day, learn songwriting, you know, is you will be sort of stepping more authentically into the real situation of your life. It's not a dress rehearsal. It's here. It's now. It's limited. You better do these things that matter if you're going to ever do them. And that will trigger some, there'll be some anxiety or you'll think like, oh, I'm not really doing it properly now. Like I don't have what it takes to really get into this now or I haven't found the right, I haven't got the right equipment or something, you know. And you just have to sort of ride that out a bit because yeah. like, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. So, uh, two, two nights ago, I was at an Ed Sheeran concert in 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 london uh it was it, it was it was it was quite weird getting tickets for it because it was like only two thousand people in like a tiny church and you had to like pre-order the vinyl of his album <laughs> before nice. it came out and i i don't have a vinyl play player but i pre-ordered <laughs> the vinyl of his album anyway just to be able to enter this competition to get tickets and we got tickets in the end and he said a very very inspiring story um so he's got this new christmas song out with elton john I yeah you've had an absolute banger i've had i've had it on yeah, no, ever great. since and before he sang that song he, he told the story of how that song came about and he said that for the last few years, um, apparently he and Elton are mates. Um, so Elton's been being like, hey, you know, we should do a Christmas song together. And he was like, oh, you know, there's all other good, good Christmas songs out there. There's nothing we can add to the genre. You know, Elton, why don't you do it yourself? Or like, you know, uh, maybe I'll think about a Christmas song in like 2023. And then he said that a few months ago, uh, one of his best friends passed away. Um, and it made him realize that like, oh, my God you know, the finitude of existence and stuff. Mm -hmm. And why am I putting off like spending Christmas with Elton John doing this cool project <laughs> with like my mentor and my friend where we get to dress up as like silly Christmas reindeers and stuff. Why am I putting that off? 
So let's just do it now. And he said that that realization was what made them put the song out this year rather than three, four, four, four years from now. I just find that really inspiring of like, you know, actually, you know, the kind of the stuff that you talk about that life is short. And if you want to do something, then often there are relatively few barriers to actually let's just do it now. Yeah. And it's very easy to be like, oh, I will, I don't know, I'll, I'll uh, write my symphony tomorrow <laughs> rather than. Yeah, you know. no, absolutely. I think it's, and uh, I, th- I totally agree. Yeah. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the end, the practical stuff. Yeah. Cause I was, as, as I was listening to this, I was like, oh, this would be a really good book to do a video about. And I was like, oh crap, I'm going to figure out a way of like turning into practical advice. And then very conveniently in the appendix, you have Yeah, like, just, just use those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I think of it. Like, okay, there are 10 main <laughs> points of this video. Let's start with the philosophical stuff. Right. Shall we go over some of your 10 tools for embracing your finitude? Sure. Which is a nice little title for, uh, for this. Um, so number one, you say it, adopt a fixed volume approach to productivity. Like, what's the deal with that? This is just like a general approach to work. And I point out in the book that, um, you know, Cal Newport is one of the people who's writing uh, most uh, in the most focused way about this stuff, I think, where you uh, where you sort of you put front and center your your capacities, your the amount of time you have perhaps also your energy levels. You think about that first, and then you think about fitting what you can into that box in terms of tasks, as opposed to, I absolutely must get through these 15 things today, and I'm just going to have to, like, um, find a way to do it. So an obvious obvious example of this is, yeah, you you decide that you finish work at 6 p.m. every day, and then that creates sort of... uh, that, that creates a box that's available for work that day. And then you think, well, what's the most important stuff to fit into this box that I reasonably can? Obviously, it doesn't get you totally past that problem of um, fitting, trying to fit twice as many things mm. into the box as, as you actually can do. But it, but it puts your finitude first and says, like, okay, <laughs> these are the facts. Time is limited. And then how am I going to respond to that situation today and make the best decisions as opposed to, yeah, like... I've, I've got to get through this amount of stuff, even if it's like literally, literally impossible that, yeah. you ever, that you ever could. Okay, tip number two, serialize, serialize, serialize. What does that mean? <laughs> Again, related, same sort of idea, but this is, in a, a, this is sort of more longitudinal. This is this idea of, of, of um, limiting your work in progress, Make it choosing, uh, making, if you've got multiple big projects, um, to the extent that you humanly can, doing one at a time, finishing one before you move on to the next one, and like expecting to that, that that will make you feel anxious about the ones that you're making wait. Uh, but understanding that, that that kind of willingness to feel that discomfort, but to focus in this way is actually a, just a vastly more um, practical way to make more progress. And that when you do the opposite of that and sort of try to do them all at once, really you're just giving into this this desire to feel limitless mm. to feel like you're like taking care of business you're the air traffic controller of of the world you know um and and it's it's a nice feeling but it's actually not the path to um getting more useful meaningful stuff done nice love it uh oh tip three decide in advance what to fail at and the credit here, as I say in the book, goes to a writer called John Acuff. But this is this lovely notion of like strategic underachievement where you say to yourself, look, life is finite and my capacities are finite. That means that I'm going to be failing at some things that I, that I might otherwise succeed at. That's just maths. That's not, that's not a criticism of anybody. So if you then decide up front what some of those domains are going to be, that's actually a much more sort of... Um, uh, peaceful and happy way to mm. go through life because instead of instead of sort of getting to the end of the day and feeling terrible that the house isn't as tidy as you wanted it to be or that you didn't mow the lawn or something you'd be like no no like are you already decided so for now for this month for this period of my life whatever i'm i'm going to not be successful at keeping a tidy house <laughs> yeah. and so that one is off the table it's, and then you can focus your energies more more on um, things that you do care about i have i have you know spent long periods of my life thinking i, I wishing i could get much better at cooking than i am mm. i'm really not a good cook yeah. i think i can cook <laughs> nutritious basically nutritious meals from the point of view of like feeding my son and then my <laughs> wife tolerates those nutritious meals yeah. and it's like actually realizing oh it's not going to happen anytime soon that i give this the thought and the practice that it needs huge liberation nice yeah i've been i've been saying that for the last like four years you know i, I really should do cooking this year and I've just been li- living off takeaways. And I'm like, actually, you know what? 
that's actually fine for this <laughs> season of my life. <laughs> right, right, right. As long as the belly doesn't get too <laughs> too large. Um, oh, well, we'll skip number four. T- t- tip number five is consolidate your caring. I think one of the one of the ways in which we um, are sort of induced by the modern world to do more than we can do is is to sort of is to care about more social, ethical, charitable issues than we possibly could. So, especially with social media, you're going to be you're going to find out about vastly more crises around the world and good causes than you could possibly focus on and you're going to be um and everyone's going to say that their cause is the most important one in the world because that's how the attention economy works you never get a fundraising email from a charity that says like this thing that we're focused on is the third or sixth most important issue facing the world today so can you give us your money it's always got to be the first that everyone's in a sort of arms race in that respect so i just think it's really useful for people who are who feel that pull of the duty to like be a good citizen not everyone does but like if you do to think like when you see the truth of this situation that there's more to care about than you possibly could uh, more than like the greatest saints in history were ever asked to care about because they didn't have global digital communication that's when you can say like okay well i'm gonna maybe i'll pick one two issues that really matter to me i'll dedicate some time to activism some money to, to 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 supporting them and then I will like proactively decide that the other ones are not my problem, even though they could be really serious and involve a lot yes. of human suffering. Yeah. So you could say like, you know what? I'm actually not going to be thinking, worrying when I about like what I can do for climate change, say, because actually like the welfare of immigrants is my is my focus. Mm. Right. And it's not because the other one isn't really important. Yeah. It's that like it makes more sense for you to sort of concentrate your limited energies in one and yeah. the other one to someone else yeah yeah i really like that um there's a an organization called giving what we can that has this um pledge that i've that i've taken that i've made a few videos about which is that the pledge to donate 10 percent of your income every year to cost-effective charities mm-hmm. and you know in this whole like effective altruism and stuff movement of like hey how can we do the most good with with our resources there is there is this idea of that yes you could donate more. It could be 11 or 12 or 15 or 18. And, and while we're there, why don't you stop working at your job and volunteer at this thing? And while we're right. there, why not like, and the list just continues. And what they found is that look, you know, <laughs> we all have limited bandwidth to think about all of these things, which are really, really, really important. Mm-hmm. And so if we just set a rule for ourselves that, okay, without thinking about it, 10% of my income every year is going to go to the ch- one of the charities that GiveWell.org deems yeah, to be the right. most cost efficient. Right. So against Malaria Foundation yeah. or Schistosomiasis Prevention or whatever. And, and recognizing that, yes, that means that there are some causes that will be underfunded, and I, but not, not overly beating ourselves up about the fact that there's nothing we can do about those. Um, right. I think that's like a nice way of doing it, which is like kind of this, again, this middle ground yeah. idea. Ooh, tip seven, seek out novelty in the mundane. Everyone older than about 25 has this experience of time speeding up as they get older, right? So that your childhood seems like summer's lasted forever. <clears throat> and then the older you get, the, the more rapidly time seems to pass, which is kind of really depressing. And the usual advice on reversing it, that feeling is to like have lots of novel experiences because we process, the more data we process from our experiences, the more, the more we remember them as mm-hmm. lasting a long time. Um, but I'm sort of incorporating here a point from the meditation teacher Shinzen Young, who points out that like if you really focus on if you if you get better at training your attention to process more data from whatever you're doing, like that's another way to the same goal, right? So it's not just so it's not just that you um, have to go on like exotic trips all the time. Though that's great yeah. if you can. Yeah. It's that you can also just like pay more attention to the things you're already doing and and you will actually life will feel more expansive in in that sense tip number eight to be a quote researcher in relationships what's what's the deal with that i really benefited from encountering this perspective because it's like i think if you're like trying to exert too much control over life is a problem anywhere but trying to exert too much control in relationships um whether it manifests as like you being a huge controlling jerk or you sort of withdrawing and being a commitment phobe like they're both sort of two sides of the same coin mm. doesn't work because other people are kind of endlessly mysterious and infuriating and that's kind of like the whole the whole sort of value and point of being in relationships so this idea that like of cultivating an attitude of curiosity so in the parenting context that would just be you know can i if i've got like a couple of hours where it's me and my son and solo can i sort of like ask like 
who is this person? Like, who am I getting to? Who is this person becoming? Like, yeah. what, what's he interested in? What, what could we, what, what does he want to do that we could do together? You know, as opposed to either, like, I've got a plan and you've got to follow it, which yeah. is a total nightmare with small children, or the flip side of that, which would be like, I don't know, you decide what to do. I'm just here to look after you, which is also kind of like, kind of asshole mm. So I think um, that, that sort of idea of like, oh, who, like, who is this person I'm getting to know? And I think it works in all relationships. It's really, I'm not, not saying I'm really good at it, yeah. but uh, it's that sort of openness to whatever might happen. Yeah. Actually, instead of trying to have a strong preference for what should happen. Yes. Yeah, I think that, that really applies in like the, the dating world as well, where I've certainly found that in, in the past, I would go on a date with someone that I like being like, oh, I, I really want them to like me. Mm-hmm. And now it's more of a, uh, it, it's, it's, there's still a little bit of that, but now it's a little bit more on the side of I wonder what that's. I wonder what this person is like. I wonder how we'll connect. And mm-hmm. yeah, I, you know, this idea of being a, being a researcher, like being genuinely curious to the mm-hmm. experience rather than wanting an outcome and trying to push towards it. Okay, so tip number nine is pra- cultivate instantaneous generosity. I love this idea so much. I'm, I I really am so much a work in progress with it. But but um. Joseph Goldstein, the meditation teacher, has this has this th- this practice that if a if a generous impulse arises yeah. in his mind, the practice is to try to act on it right away. So if you have the thought like, I should, I'd like to give some money to that charity, or I'd like to reach out to that friend and say how much I appreciate them, or send someone some email about their work that you yeah. that you liked, like do it then, because what gets in the way over and over again is not that you sort of decide, oh, actually, they don't deserve your, they don't deserve it. We yeah. should, I should just keep quiet. What, what happens is you, it, just gets, it just gets sort of entangled in the stuff of everyday life or in this idea that you're going to become the kind of person. I was talking to someone the other day who's, who said, like, they'd made some pledge to themselves that they were going to try and, like, send one or maybe three, I don't know, it was like emails of praise to people who they really appreciated like every week or every day mm. or something and of course the effect of that is to stop you just sending one email today because you're like oh i haven't got to the stage yet where i've really got that habit implemented yes. so for now i'm just not going to do it at all yes. whereas of course the thing you ought to do i think and i aspire to do is is to just don't worry about the kind of person you're becoming yeah just send that one note that's really good this is a this is like ex- ex- is the exact trap that i fall into when you know, this morning I was like, oh, I've just messaged this person who's been like a good kind of friend and mentor over the last year. Uh, I should get him something for Christmas. Okay, let me add that to my, to my to-do list of n- nice things to do so that I can bash those, those tasks and <laughs> yeah. get them all. I was like, oh yeah, I'm thinking about my old housemate. I should probably send her a message. You know what? Let's add that to the list so oh, that totally. when I get yeah, around to it, totally. then I will just be able to do all this one and go. But yeah. if instead we switch to the model of if it is something related to gratitude, then do it now, regardless of what is happening. That will probably lead to a happy life. <laughs> yeah, and you'll, all, you'll be that person that you're yeah. waiting to become. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. I love it. Okay, that's a very, like, I'm going to change that from, like, right now. Um, and finally, tip number <laughs> don't, 10. Don't try even to do that perfectionistic, yeah, right? Because no, that's like, where it all yeah, goes wrong. You know? Daily-ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and finally, uh, tip number 10, practice doing nothing. I mean, I think this is just generally excellent yeah. advice, but but I'm talking in that section about, um, specifically about, like, non-directive meditation, this approach to meditation where you're not even trying to follow the breath. You're setting a timer, you're sitting there, and you're not doing anything. And if you catch yourself doing something, thinking about something, following the breath, and it, for wriggling around, you're just like, just stop doing that thing. Keep stopping, keep stopping, keep stopping. It makes you see how... Shinzen Young calls it do nothing meditation. Uh, there are books calling it non-directive meditation. Um, whatever. It makes you see how hard it is to do. Yeah. To do, and it's probably impossible on some philosophical level to do nothing at all. But but this sort of action of constantly sort of letting go of the thing that you're doing, doing nothing is really hard. And 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 I think you sort of you can actually get some good cognitive training benefits quite quite quickly from just a few minutes on a regular mm-hmm. basis of really trying to do nothing and breath following meditation which is so useful in so many ways is kind of not the, that's something different and because then you're sort of really you can there's a temptation to like really bear down on like i'm going to become super focused actually doing nothing for a few minutes it's kind of the scariest thing in the world in a way okay wonderful okay so we've got a bunch of questions about uh productivity and happiness and stuff off of the instagram and the twitter so Excellent. i'll just feed those to you and we can we can have a bit of a chat sure so just grace underscore says <laughs> how how do you deal with procrastination <laughs> that old chestnut <laughs> yeah um 
Well, firstly, I think everything we've been talking about here is is an answer to that is an answer to that question because I think a lot of procrastination has this perfectionistic motivation. Like I'm not going to start until I can know that I can finish or I know that I can do it well. And so anything you can do to just sort of fall into reality instead is going to help you with um, with that. Um, I'm also really uh, charmed by a technique that I came across in a I mean, it's got other, it, it, it crops up in other places. I'm really charmed by this technique that I came across in a book called um, The More You Do, The Better You Feel by, I think, David Parker is the author. It's kind of an idiosyncratic uh, book. Yeah. But he just has this method that he calls the just one thing method where you literally like write down on a, on a piece of lined paper a thing you're going to do, do it, cross it out, write another one immediately below it, do it, cross it out continue yeah it's really bizarre how this should possibly work given especially for those of us who have all our complicated kanban boards yeah. and all the rest of it but it's kind of like this is a powerful way to get yourself out of a nice. rut it's just to sort of narrow your time horizon down to like what is one thing that i'm gonna do mm. do that thing cross it out yeah keep, keep making the list longer yeah, this is basically my method, except that it's it's, it's like genuinely just that one thing, <laughs> which is like you know the whole kind of what's the what's the most important thing I need to do today. Mm -hmm. um, my other my whole theory on procrastination is basically, I think procrastination is a problem with getting started, and distraction is the thing that comes later once you've gotten started. Yeah, and so to beat procrastination, we just want to make it as easy as possible to get started. So like setting a goal within our control making sure it's just like we've got it's it's easy enough to kind of make the time for it lowering the bar as much as possible to embrace embrace that it's probably going to be a bit crap but like we do it anyway mm. and kind of even sometimes convincing ourselves that we're only going to do the thing for two minutes because yeah. once we've gotten started then at that point it's so much easier to keep going yeah. just, it's actually yeah. just sitting down and starting to write the first words or, or whatever that, that feels like the hardest part um midwife's ibby says how can we think about time in a more healthy way, like not in a race to the finish line kind of way? Again, I sort of want to gesture to yeah, our, to like our whole conversation. The whole, the whole book. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, I think that just seeing, the, just, just seeing the fact that the way we relate to time is, is not the only way, not the only way it's ever been done. Um, thinking about this notion that crops up in various philosophers that, that, that maybe it makes sense to say not that we have time but that we are time that we are this kind of little period of time from birth through to death and then it, you can't really be in a, you can't really be in a war or battle with that then because you've sort of you, you you're, you're thinking about it completely differently it's just it's just the medium in which your life is unfolding um, if the question was seeking a more practical answer than that, then <laughs> I apologize. I think um, the answer in a more practical vein is is just, you know, all the things we've been talking about to be incremental, to focus on one thing, to uh, set the goal at an attainable level. All these things just sort of reduce the re reduce the, the momentum of that race to the finish and bring you back to just doing the thing that you're doing right now. Nice. Love it. Um, Syrah Mahmood underscore says, what are your thoughts on the four hour work week? I'm assuming she means the book rather than the, the yeah, the I mean, concept. it had a big yeah. impact on me. Now I was a little bit rude about it at one point when I was uh, writing this column, uh, because I was a little bit rude about every successful, uh, <laughs> productivity book. But I think, you know, um, the, the sort of, um, business money-making side of that was not something that I was that particularly was my was my thing but the stuff about the Pareto principle the stuff about like figuring out that like 80 that 20 percent of the effort you put into things 20 percent of the people that you deal with deliver 80 percent of the value 20 percent of the mm -hmm. and 80 percent of the problems that you have come from 20 percent of the projects you're involved in that sort of thing and those kind of that was, a, I mean, it was a like getting things done. I think it was like a really, really important um, b b sort of formative text in in thinking about these things in this new way. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think, as f to the best of my knowledge, Tim Ferriss does not claim that he works no, for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so I don't, I don't, 
I don't think anyone's getting to an actual four-hour work week. One of, one of his recent ep podcast episodes was the audio for the presentation he gave at South by Southwest in 2007, just before the book came out. And someone had found like the high quality audio of it. And it was just so interesting to hear like 15 years later, him from 15 years ago describe the ideas in the book, which was all around the Pareto principle, this, you know, eliminating stuff. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, yeah, just really good. And I think for me, one of the books that had probably the single book that's had the most impact on my life. Yeah. Uh, not... For me, it was less from a productivity standpoint and more from like actually the business passive income right. lifestyle. And the other thing standpoint. I remember from there is the idea of um, not deferring like the mini retirements idea. Yeah. Is that, that is totally like in tune with what I'm trying to get at here in the sense that it's about like not not endlessly deferring the, the moment of value in life to some point across the horizon, but taking it now for yeah. like going and doing that thing for a week uh, instead of instead of it always being in the future. Nice. Um, Muckund15761 says, how did it feel to write the book? Was there any sort of regret that you had about your life while writing it? It's <laughs> a very, very interesting question. <laughs> interesting. I mean, the process of writing the book was the process of kind of coming to understand what I believed about these things. So it was a sort of a therapeutic act. And I was, ch I was sort of transformative in the sense that like I couldn't write it to the end until I'd kind of slightly become a different person. Uh, so it was very, very important for me. It was not just a question of like, I'd figured these ideas out and now I was going to generously write them down for other people. It was like, this was the act of mm. making big strides in my own sort of understanding of, of all of this. I'm not sure it's quite the question about regret. Looking back on it, I would say if, if the question is, do I regret anything about the process of writing the book, which I'm not sure it quite was, but then, you know, I, there were times in that process where I was not a pleasant person to live with because oh. I was so anxious about it or I was so deep in the ideas or I was so unsure if I could carry it off and things like that, you know. And then and then I think you become slightly sort of moody presence around your house and that's, I don't think that was, so I think I made a lot of sacrifices to get this book written, but kind of my wife did as well a little bit and yeah. she maybe didn't sign up for them in the same way that, that I had, so. Uh, nice. Yeah, that. I want to ask you much more about that at lunch, like the whole process <laughs> of writing a book. Um, Anyway, uh, Noah Shaju underscore says, how do we stop the fear of missing out um, factoring in our lives? Again, I really am sorry, but I do think this is a perspective shift rather than a cool technique. And the, the perspective shift is this. The problem is not that, the, the question is not how do you avoid the fear of missing out. The, 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 the trick is to see that missing out is just completely guaranteed on an epic scale. Like, even in eras before our own, but especially in this one, the mismatch between the time that you have and the time you'll have to take advantage of various opportunities and the number of those potential opportunities is just, it's so crazy that like missing out is the basic situation in life. You'll like, if you do like three really cool things today, there were an effectively infinite number that you didn't do. So like, that's great actually, because then you can be like, okay, that ship has sailed, missing out is happening. Now, wh which of the infinite number of things that I uh, could in principle do, shall I actually do? I think that's a really, it's really helpful to sort mm -hmm. of, and then you, then, then you can almost get, to, in fact, I think you can get to the state of actually taking a sort of active joy in the fact that, um, that you're missing out because it becomes an, aff an affirmation of the things you do choose. If, you just, if I decide to... If I feel like I sort of have to stay at home at night and give my son a bath and put him to bed, there's room for resentment. But if I see that, like, I could have done various things and I chose on some level to do this one. Mm. I mean, choice is a little awkward in parenting because <laughs> you sort of, like, <laughs> had to happen. But there is choice involved. Yeah. If, you, if you can see that you're sort of willingly missing out on uh, other things because missing out is inevitable, then you can sort of really become more absorbed in the, yeah. in the thing you choose to do. Yeah, it's like the difference between uh, have to and get to. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Seeing life, seeing life as a to-do list you have to get through versus a menu that you're that you're choosing. You get from. to choose yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. And I, and, and I guess like I guess recognizing this is important in, in in other areas of life as well. For example, one thing that Alain de Botton often often talks about when it comes to ro romance is that if we marry someone and we think that we're never going to be attracted to anyone else ever again. We're just setting ourselves up, up for failure because, of course, there are, are a zillion people around the world that you could be attracted to and you probably would be attracted to. But mm. the fact is that you've chosen to spend your life with this one person and embracing that yeah. rather than trying to go against it or thinking that it shouldn't happen 
is kind of this idea of kind of the, the joy of missing out. Yes, I am choosing to miss out on these other potential, you know, dalliances or <laughs> yeah. whatever the phrase is. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Dua Tajwa says, what is the midpoint of being comfortably busy, but not too busy in your mind? That's really interesting. In the, in the, um, in the book I write about, uh, I think this might pass many of the people in the audience by, but I write about um, Richard Scarry's children's books. Did, were they part of your Never heard of childhood? <laughs> Richard Scarry's an American illustrator who wrote these books called, uh, part of a series called Busy Town. And they're just like these great, super detailed spreads of like, uh, of, uh, like city life, but all the people in them are animals. So like, you know, the, the grocery is run by a family of pigs and the firefighters are raccoons, I think. And it's all, and they're all, uh, the whole point is that everyone's really busy, but the, but the kind of busy that they are is not is is that they have tons to do and you just get and like you get the sense from how they enjoy their business that they also think they've got about the right amount of time to do all these things right they're not overwhelmed he didn't call it overwhelmed town yeah. which would have been a kind of weird uh, title <laughs> yeah. for a series of children's books and that i think that I, I bring this up even though it's a cultural reference that might pass most people by because there's something really beautiful about that like it's not bad to be busy people you know um Elderly people sometimes talk about like being busy as as a positive in their lives. You know, it's like how how are you doing? Well, it's good. I'm keeping busy. You know, there's lots of lots of things going on. It's like the, the midpoint is being active in the world is great. Having a whole ton of things you want to achieve is great. Thinking that you're going to achieve more of them than it is going to be temporarily possible for you to achieve that's where you you go over that um, that boundary. So um, you know. Filling, filling life with activities is, is, is a great thing. I don't think that necessarily having nothing on your to-do list would be a desirable state mm. at all. Yeah, I think, I think the way I think of this is sort of like uh, hmm, climate rather than weather. In that on a given day, I might be very, quote, busy. Like jumping from one meeting to another, to another thing, to another thing. Having breakfast, lunch, dinner, and coffee with different people all in one day. And that would be exhausting if it happened every day, mm. but it's quite exhilarating once in a while. Yeah. And so if I, I like to sort of casually think about, you know, the, the, these last couple of weeks, how, how has my calendar felt? How has my schedule felt? And if that's like broadly ish, yeah, reasonable, yeah. Then, then that's fine. Cause I think there is a trap of overthinking like oh, on, on this day, I felt particularly overwhelmed because of ABC. It's like, ah, oh, I mean, seasons of life, seasons of the week, like it's, it's all good. Yeah, right. And there's a very great tendency to think like if a day goes, if a day goes stressfully, oh no, is my life going to be like this every single day for the rest of my existence? And likewise, that if a day goes really well um, and balanced in a balanced mm. way, like, oh, I've got to make sure every single day is like this for the end of, to the end of my existence. Like, yeah. Not helpful thoughts. Yeah. It's kind of like, <laughs> this is a weird, weird analogy, but like when it comes to posture for sitting and stuff, you know, everyone obsesses over finding the perfect posture, but in fact, the perfect posture is the next one. And like just changing your posture every hour is by right. far the best thing you can do rather than getting the perfect ergonomic chair, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I think similarly with this sort of stuff, like actually, as long as there is some balance, like or, or what you don't, what you probably don't want is a, you know, very, very, very rigid schedule where every day is the same. There is, it's nice to have some level of messiness in it. Yeah. That's kind of what brings the life into it. Um, and just being a little bit more like, Oh, pencil sketch about it rather than inking it in. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, okay. Question. We got a question from Twitter from Aparna Gurudwan. How do we decide what matters as we make most of our decisions based on, on a, uh, based on our current understanding of the world and we can't predict the future. How do we know that what matters to our present selves will matter to our future self? I mean, I think the first thing to say, I'm such a downer is that you <laughs> can't know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're all, uh, in the situation of like feeling our way from one moment to the next. Uh, but this is where I get to mention one of my favorite questions, which I also mentioned in the book from the Jungian therapist, James Hollis, who recommends that people ask of certain life choices they're facing, but I think you could apply it here. Does this choice enlarge me or diminish me? Mm. Um, and it's a kind of a weird phrasing, but it's as an alternative to like, will this make me happy or unhappy, yeah. right? There's this, there's something about the phrasing of this question that sort of, I think that most people, even if you don't know whether what you're doing right now with your life is, is like as, as making you as happy as you could be, um, even if you don't know if it's the right thing or not, according to some value system you've inherited, you kind of can answer the question like, am I, am I on a path of enlargement at the moment? Am I sort of in some sense like, 
growing. Yeah. And what's so helpful about that to me is that like, there's lots of times on a path of meaning and enlargement that are not going to be fun. Yeah. So you could, you know, if you're experiencing certain kinds of tensions and difficulties in a relationship, like this question helps you um, divide between the, the kind of difficulties that are like, oh, this is a toxic relationship. You need to get out of it. And those which are like, yeah, like, be becoming uh, closer to somebody in a relationship is tough and it has interesting difficulties and you m become a bigger person as a result of them and like you've got to be able to distinguish between those two kinds of difficulties in life because one kind you want to get rid of but the other kind is like totally crucial to, to, yeah. to growth and that question like you know whether the job you're in at the moment is like hard and challenging and not always fun, but it's but it's something that is taking you somewhere you want to go versus like it's just making my soul wither by the day and I need to change radically, you know? Yeah, I guess let's say, and again, maybe it's similar to that rocks thing, but if you're on, if you've got like multiple options and they all feel enlarging in some capacity, um, like, like for example, I guess kind of thinking selfishly, I could decide that I want to take the American medical exams and do residency in the US and do practice medicine. And that would be enlarging in some capacity. I could decide to apply for an MBA at Harvard or Stanford and that would be enlarging in some, some capacity. I could decide to actually focus in London and grow the team and that would be enlarging in some capacity. I decide to double down on the book. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's all these different options mm -hmm. for like, uh, for, for things where all options are feasibly reasonable and feasibly enlarging and <laughs> like really <laughs> life is not like long enough to do all of the things. Um, any, any thoughts there? Wow. Yeah. And like, uh, partly I want to like deliver advice to you here. And then the other part, I'm just like, no, I know exactly how you feel like about, about in a, in different contexts. It's like, it's not easy. Well, firstly, like one, one response to that is just to say, great, then, then that's fine. doesn't matter which you choose. Yeah. They're all going <laughs> to be yeah. enlarging. And then the other would be that, you know, if you, if you imagined yourself in those different paths and you maybe, you know, went to a quiet, place outdoors somewhere and journaled about them for a bit would they all stay in that way or would you would you start to be able to distinguish the degree to which other people's or parental or mm. societal agendas were um were um yeah. influencing one or another because like one thing that's so interesting about the specifically medicine right is that this is a this is a this is a career that attracts very large numbers as far as i can tell of two kinds of people number one people who find it deeply and profoundly meaningful to be doing what they're doing in medicine and the other one people who are like trying to please their parents yeah. who really wanted them to be doctors yeah or like society that uh, right, recognizes right, doctors yeah. being as like right, a, a exactly. good thing and all. so that's kind of really interesting like which side of that are you on is yeah. It, yeah that's so so fascinating uh how does one get over an unproductive rut i am going to repeat myself here because the answer is that just one thing thing i think part of the answer anyway it's that idea of like just Drain all the, if you can, drain all the angst out of this. Just like, what is a single thing? There's a quote, actually, it's in, it's in Jordan Peterson's book, 12 <laughs> Rules for Life. And so I've mentioned it occasionally and like people get cross because he's a very divisive figure. But he says this very non-divisive thing at one point, which is, you know, um, what is one thing that you could do and would do right now to add a tiny bit more order to your life? And this is where the sort of like making your bed yeah. um, cult comes from like figure out that thing do that thing reward yourself for doing that thing rinse and repeat um i think that's really uh, helpful if you're absolutely kind of paralyzed if it's you're really in the kind of like not doing anything at all kind of rut if it's a more sort of long-term rut i think i think again then something that is really helpful in the same vein is to is to uh, of a creative rut which was a question i think right like is is to sort of take the creativity question out of it. So like, if you're feeling like I can't, I haven't got any inspiration for my creative work, then I think it's really powerful to just get quantitative about it and be like, I'm going to produce X number of words or one yeah. picture per however long and to sort of turn it into quantities yes. and take out the kind of, the, if you're feeling uninspired, I think seeking to feel inspired is not, yes. is not the way forward. Just like turning it mechanistic into something you can do for a couple of weeks while you wait yeah. for inspiration to return is probably the answer. Yeah, yeah. I think, I th I think also like yeah, I'm reminded of a, I think Seth Godin was saying this to Tim Ferriss when Tim was like, oh, Seth, I'm not writing anything. I feel unproductive. And he was like, well, show me your bad writing. And he was like, 
oh, well, I haven't done any. It's like, well, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> Where I think often a rut of some description is in, is somewhat on the spectrum of perfectionism of like, you know, I only want to do this thing if it will, if it will be good enough. And it's like, well, just do a bad version of it. Like do a bad version of cleaning your room, do a bad version of reading a book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm also thinking of another thing. There's a lovely blog post that I go back to again and again by um, Susan Piver, the Buddhist teacher. Who, and it, the headline is something like getting things done by not being mean to yourself. And it, and it, um, it, it, it relates to this, it, it relates to this experience she had of sort of really wanting to be the person who like lived by that credo of like, um, uh, amateurs wait for inspiration and yeah. then the rest of us just get down to work and how that had turned for her into this kind of aggression towards <laughs> herself. And that actually sometimes if you weren't going to do anything anyway, because you're in such a rut, then you might as well ask the question, like what would be most fun to do today? Mm. Because it's not going to be worse than sitting, doing absolutely nothing and feeling miserable. Yeah. Yeah, I often find this in the evening sometimes where it's like I, I, I can choose to be dissatisfied with what I've done for the day or I can choose to just simply choose to not be dissatisfied with that. Right, <laughs> just just right. do something fun. <laughs> <And> it's, <laughs> often it's just a conscious choice of like, do I want to continue to tell the story to myself that beats myself up about this thing? Because either way, it's not going to change how much I've done. <laughs> right, right. No, exactly. <laughs> what is exactly. going to change is how yeah. I feel about myself, yeah. which is yeah. all that matters. Um, and I sometimes like, I sometimes argue this point with my mom where she says, you know, Oh, the only reason you're you're saying that is to make yourself feel better about yourself. I was like, well, yes, yeah, that, and? That's, that's the point. Now. <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> like, why would I tell myself that story then? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> but yes. Um, anyway, final question from Twitter. Uh, oh, I guess the question is in two parts. One, is it worth um, underscore times five? And Baran says, is it worth pursuing something that matters to me but isn't sustainable to do, but might be in the future? I can sort of think. I can sort of imagine contexts where that might apply right you yeah you, you kind of there might be things that you really want to do you don't think you can make them pay for example mm. but they're really important to you but maybe one day you could make them pay yeah i mean i i, I mean yes yeah i mean yeah. <laughs> I, I think i think it's i think it's worthwhile to do things that matter that's virtually a tautology yeah. and and you know one way to think about that is not to define mattering as and i do get into this section but like don't define don't set a don't set a definition of mattering that is so high that almost everything worthwhile in life fails by comparison against it. So for some people, that's like, don't, some people like don't think that they can be novelists if they can't be Tolstoy. And some, so it's that sort of like, you know, mm. historic level kind of mattering. But other people might say like, you know, what's the point in spending the next two years doing X because I don't think I can, I don't think it's feasible to spend the next 40 years doing X. Well, there might be reasons to not do that, depending on your sort of highest goals for your life. But that's not a good reason to, to decide that something doesn't matter. Yes. It can matter to do for yeah. a couple of... It can matter seasonally. A couple of, yeah, absolutely. It can matter for a couple of years and then you move on to something else and it mattered. Because otherwise, yeah. you're, again, you're just sort of storing everything up to this like alleged deathbed moment. Of yeah. Like, no, I think, like, I, I think... Is everything I think great a, now? Yeah. I think this is a trap a lot of people fall into, which is... And, and, and I certainly do as well, which is the... Um, if I cannot do this forever, there's no point doing it now. Like, oh, I don't want to start a YouTube channel because I'm not going to be a YouTuber in my 50s. Like, well, okay. <laughs> That's not a good reason to not start a YouTube channel. Maybe there are other reasons, like you're scared or <laughs> right, you don't see right. the value of it or whatever. But like, I don't see myself doing this 30 years down the line is absolutely not a good reason. Similarly, when it comes to, you know, uh, what, what, what one thing we're, we're talking about with, with Gordon, who's, who's been a personal trainer for 12 years, is can we do like a sort of body transformation for me over a period of maybe six months where, you know, work out four times a week, eat super healthily, try and, I don't know, get on the cover of Men's Health magazine just for the bands. Mm -hmm. And it's not sustainable, like obviously, right. <laughs> but that's fine. It, it, it doesn't need to be. It's a bit of fun to happen in the short term. And even then it will probably, if it happens, which it will, it's going to promote like healthy eating and it's going to promote some good habits. Yeah. Recognize it. Yeah. Which... And like, what is life other than like some episodes of things that you do yeah, until you're yeah. not doing them anymore, right? So you might as well make them meaningful ones in the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and finally, what are your thoughts on the idea that, ooh, okay. So there was this tweet that came out a few days ago. I suspect the person who wrote the tweet did it ironically, okay. like knowing that this was going to rile people up the wrong way. Okay. And lots of people have become riled up the right. wrong way. So I'll just read the tweet Best out to use you. Of Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, quite. <laughs> Hot take. The easiest way to put yourself behind in life is going traveling for months on end in your early 20s to, quote, find yourself. 
It's an absolute success killer and puts you behind the majority. Why waste the key years of your life meant for building and getting ahead? So that's the tweet, which lots of people are dunking on because it, it's just obviously bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I guess this person wants you to also dunk on that. Like, what are your thoughts on right. the fact that yeah. exploring yourself yeah. is like a success killer and we want right. to get ahead in life? Just get down to business. Yeah. <laughs> Found Theranos. Yes. Be on your way. <laughs> exactly. And, well, the first thought I have about that is that like, it, it's, it's, it, it's obviously nonsense from a certain perspective, which is the perspective I know most naturally want to take. There might be industries where that is like true relative to that industry. Yeah. Like I don't know. And I wouldn't want to ever like give people terrible mm. advice because I don't know their industry. I can, I'm sure there are um, like places where the path of advancement is, is structured in such a way that that becomes true for that mm. industry. I think it's, like, it's, it's pretty true in medicine. Right. You spend your 20s like striving for this thing right. such that you can then enjoy life in your right. 30s or 40s. But, so firstly, yeah. you have to see that it's relative to that industry. So the yeah. question is, does success in that industry matter to you more than anything else and matter to you more than exploring and finding yourself in your 20s? And it yeah. might do. Um, and then if it turns out that that was the wrong path, you can always go and explore and find yourself in your 40s. I mean, like plenty of people do that. But no, I mean, it's obviously not. It, it, it's a it's a comment that you're going to tell me now it's from by, made by some like close friend or somebody I want to like me or something. No, no, the, like, I, I don't, don't know worry. who that it's all, tweet it's all good. from. Random. <laughs> um, uh, that like it, it's a it's a it's a it's an observation that that takes as read precisely the thing that we're like what should be debating here, which is like yeah. what is a meaningful life for you. Mm. It, it's, it, it assumes that professional advancement in the industries where this applies is the thing that matters the most. And then it says, well, don't do this other thing. It's like, maybe if you're someone who, for whom what matters um, sifts out that way, but if you're not, then it's kind of ridiculous. So I think it mainly just shows that that, that kind of very specific advice then offered to literally everyone yeah. as if it were applied to them all is just, uh, is, is, is crazy. I did. I, I don't really know if we if we kind of touched on this, but do you have a, a theory on how to how to figure out what actually matters to us? Big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the enlargement and diminishment yeah. stuff that we talked about is a part of it. Um, and then I was very conscious and deliberate writing this book, for example, of not wanting to offer a laundry list, of not wanting to be like, oh, yeah. relationships, time spent in nature, getting yeah. enough sleep. You know, it's like either people know all that anyway, or yeah. it's or it's going to be lost on them anyway. Right, right, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I can't help you with that. Um, and I'm not necessarily a sort of great exemplar of it either. I, do, I think basically peop, most people, certainly my real experience of this question is just in terms of how it, how it goes in life. It, it's not a question of like you, you spend a week at a retreat and you figure the answer to this out mm -hmm. and you never return to it. Lots of books that I remember criticizing in my early days in the col garden column, you know, they give this idea that you're going to, it's like, first of all, figure out your like, like core values, core life yeah. values. Now, once you've done that and you're like, hold on a second. <laughs> but, yeah. like, and I think that seeing it as seeing these things as part of as, as, a, as, a, as an, a part of the journey that is it's always there on the journey. Right. So I think like I think it's helpful to think of the process of being alive and moving through life as the process of clarifying what a meaningful life is nice. for you um, instead of this. I mean, I'm not saying it can't help sometimes to like go and spend two days coming up with a vision statement, but like that, that's going to then change and have to adapt within, within days, presumably. I think that idea that you're going to sort it out, that we all have a single stable purpose and then you've got to just spend the rest of your life mm -hmm. executing on this insight you had. I just, I, I don't know anyone for whom that worked that way. And it certainly didn't yeah. for me. So yeah. Far. Agreed. I've tried all these exercises and they're just like, <laughs> some of them have, have, have been useful, but in the sense that, um, they just give clarity and we it, it they encourage us to ask the sorts of questions we just wouldn't normally right um but i think i just come back come back to that like uh, tightness of gripping metaphor that you right. that, that you said earlier which is that gripping too tightly to a vision statement or values or anything like that it's not that the values are the problem it's that the the, the tightness of gripping is the problem yeah and we relax yeah. our grip and be a little, little bit more chill about it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and it's great to put time and thought into um you know your plan that is just a statement of yeah. intent in the yeah. present moment. It's, it's thinking that your plan is anything more than that. That, yeah. is, that, yeah, that is a problem, I think. Nice. Um, so we normally need to wrap up with a series of just some quick fire questions. So question number one, uh, what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? The, the feel of this is very easy. I'm trying to phrase it right. I mean, it's basically, um, <laughs> it's basically something like you don't need to 
struggle so hard to like justify your existence on the planet nice a little bit candid that's good i love it <laughs> <laughs> uh who has had the biggest influence on your career that is a really hard question to answer i'm i think that um two editors at the guardian ian katz and merripy mills made probably had the biggest like opportunities they offered me or things they saw that figured out that i could do with their with their under their guidance probably made the biggest difference but they're also like the very first people who got me my very first start before mm. that and then my parents like i could answer yeah. that question a million ways what is one tip for someone looking for success <laughs> wow I don't know. Um, big questions aren't they <laughs> yeah uh um uh, focus on one thing at a time nice uh, what does the first and last hour of your day look like? The whole day as opposed to a working day. Uh, I've talked about my first hour, get up about 5, 5.30ish, drink coffee, write in my journal. Um, last hour is um, sort of stumble around in a, in a bleary-eyed state, uh, sort of closing down the house and uh, um, having sort of probably read to my son and then... Um, uh sort of reading or listening to podcasts until i fall asleep it's not very nice. really interesting is that, is that <laughs> that's good it's <laughs> the truth yeah <laughs> the productivity gurus <laughs> um what's one physical thing maybe under 100 pounds or thereabouts that has added disproportionate value to your life well the tiny little digital kitchen timer that i think was 20 pounds that i carry everywhere and have in my bag right oh. now um uh, is certainly i do use that for like sort of various um ad hoc time boxing operations uh so so that's uh that's at that price point and instead of your that, phone that's probably true yeah i just it's it's separate yeah it's like my my phone can be a put away while i'm focusing it buzzes yeah i, I mm. it, it doesn't have doesn't lure me into other things it's it's single single task technology i'm really i'm Love really it. yeah uh, you talk about that in the, really the book into. as well um at a t different price point it's not under 100 but it yeah. just relates i'll just mention it if you're interested i i have this um this tablet called remarkable oh yeah. do you like it i i i'm loving it no I way not i tried everyone. it for a few weeks and right. went, went back to the ipad like why why do you like it <laughs> Uh, it's just yeah it's just so quiet you know it's just, and like mentally quiet it's yeah. just like it's no, I'm single, not going to click away to other things it's just paper except it has a few benefits and a few downsides yeah. compared to paper but like that, and it's just like it's physically a pleasure to it is nice to write to write on yeah um, maybe I should dust no, off my remarkable too no maybe it's not maybe it's not for you because I, I do really like the Kindle for that like right. as opposed to reading on a phone or an iPad just because there's zero chance of getting distracted yeah and the only thing I could get distracted by is another book, which is a good distraction. Right, exactly. You end up sort of like searching the Kindle store in order yeah. to not focus on the book you're reading, but that's okay. That's, not so that's it. Fine. Um, what book other than your own would you recommend to anyone? At a certain point in life, I would recommend a book called Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life by James Hollis, who I've mentioned, although um, there may be people in the audience here who are like it's a bit of a midlifey kind of second half kind of is book. in post 40 or post marriage <laughs> uh <laughs> well i mean midlife in the jungian sense uh, can be anything from like about 35 to 70 i think okay. when when that sort of moment comes so like you know it's probably not for people in their early 20s though james hollis has written things that, that could be for definitely could be for everyone um i'm just trying to think if there's a if there's a book that uh is yeah so what's something you'd recommend to me like you, you've had a look at my bookshelf awesome. we broadly read the same stuff uh, yeah is there anything kind of a bit off the beaten track like maybe that didn't hit the new york times list <laughs> that, yeah that, that, um, that you found really interesting let me think i will get there i'll just need to you'll yeah. need to cut out the bit where i'm of just course. sitting here yeah, looking run, up into run my the search function into my brain it seems like you read a lot of philosophy stuff which i yeah. haven't read like i feel like i need to start reading a bunch of this stuff because it all is, is is all the stuff that we read about just a thousand years ago <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and the, certainly the the Stoics in the original are really, that's not a problem to read. Uh, Heidegger, I kind of made a show in the book of the, how difficult it was to grapple with Heidegger. Yeah. I do not recommend that people, <laughs> like, go and read uh, uh, Being in Time uh, just for fun, because that is so... Uh, crazy on the writing front it's not a new uh, it's not a new observation at all but bird by bird by Anne Lamott is a really really good oh, uh, book okay. about writing never heard of it sound like you haven't heard of it no. wow we can introduce it to a new generation Anne Lamott bird by bird uh, instructions on writing and life oh sick all right I'll get that on Kindle right now I guess the next question is more like applies to 
entrepreneurs, but I guess, I, I guess in your case, yeah, you are basically an entrepreneur. Um, if, if you lost everything, let's say some level. you got canceled, you lost all your money, lost all your following, didn't have the books, didn't have the publishing deals, what would you do to rebuild? I guess it would depend how canceled I was because, you know, the, the thing that I would do um, based on my skills and contacts right now is I would reach out to various editors for whom I've written things in the past and see if they wanted me to write so, things so, for them. But if, I've been, if the idea is that I've been cancelled so much that none of them will talk to me. Yeah, or that is kind of in this hypothetical version, you're mm. kind of starting from scratch. Right, and you, yeah. You don't have anything other than the skills that you've developed. Right, yeah. That's interesting. On one level, I sort of have explored all these different areas and I feel like I know quite a lot about quite a lot of different areas but on another level there is one skill that I have which is like talking to a bunch of people and reading a bunch of stuff and turning it into mm. pieces of writing so I think I would have to like so I guess how, how is, the do idea, is, the, is the idea of the ideal answer sorry to make them heavy no of course is yeah. the idea that you're going to say you're going to find a totally different profession where the same things apply or is it just that you like start again because I think I probably would have to just like write stuff yeah I, I mean find, that find makes a lot of for it sense I, I, I guess the question is sort of aimed at sort of people in their probably early 20s or late teens who right. are trying to figure out what to do with their lives and want to find like a path to, I don't know, salvation. Um, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I think I, I'm fascinated. I don't think I'm not saying I could do it. Yeah. I'm kind of fascinated uh, because I think I'm probably too self-centered, but I'm fascinated by the career of, by the careers of like psychotherapists, mm. psychoanalysts, people like that. Um, I think that would be very, very interesting. Um, I could probably be an academic of some some kind but i'm not sure i'd want to be i'm really lamely answering this question no. i don't know is the answer <laughs> yeah like how how hard would it be to get to to, to how how hard is it for someone to be a professional writer these days if that makes sense as a question i mean it depends on what you mean if you mean can you make exclusively make a handsome living solely off the income from books themselves then that's a very small number of people okay. i think um, or it's people who are so frugal that they're able to make their book advances um, mm. spread out over multiple years. But I guess as a writer, there are other business models. Right. No, no. And if you mean, yeah. you know, if yeah. you mean have a book, get an advance for the book, build an audience, do certain kinds of paid work that you wouldn't have got in the absence of the book. Yeah. Like, I mean, there are more of them and I'm one of those people, yeah. I think now. Um, probably more than I am a freelance journalist in terms of the day-to-day -day content of my work. But if people think it's like, you sell, you sell like millions of books yeah. and you make huge amounts of money on each one. Like none of that applies uh, except maybe to like, you know, five people on the planet. Or something. Yeah. It's like, I, th I think it's kind of how being a YouTuber, y yes, there are five people on the planet who are making these stupid amounts of money off the back of their YouTube channels, but there are plenty more who are making stupid amounts of money off the back of the YouTube channel, plus the other things that offshoot yeah. off that and just thinking more intelligently about the business model and maybe making a course, maybe writing a book, maybe like sort of doing the other stuff that becomes available as an offshoot off of sharing something you enjoy and building an audience around that thing. And yeah. I think if I, if I lost all the things, I would probably just do that again. Because <laughs> it, it's a skill, like, and it right. just takes right. some time and it's kind of fun. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, I'm responding to the thought experiment by questioning the premises of the thought experiment, which is an obnoxious thing no, to do. <laughs> okay, what, feel, feel free to question <laughs> the premise of this, but uh, what quote or mantra do you live by? There isn't just one that I'm thinking of every single day, but the ones that spring to mind, uh, partly I've mentioned James Hollis, does this choice enlarge me or diminish me? Uh, Shell and Cop, um, you're free to do what you want. You have only to face the consequences. And... Um, uh, a question that I think I, I, I'm borrowing from a conversation I heard Sam Harris talk about he once, his, his once having where he was moaning about his problems in his work or something to somebody and she responded like hold on do, do you think you're are you under the impression that one day you're going to get to a stage in your life where you don't have problems um, so some formulation of that it's like no the problems or I quote my wife now but, but like sometimes when I'm complaining about the problems that are keeping me from getting down to the, 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 the meat of my job, she'll say, based on her own understanding that she learned in her own work, like, no, no, the problems are the job. And like, that's a very freeing thing to realize that like, th th you're not going to get to the point of without yeah. problems. That's not a mantra. Wow. That's a no. long mantra, like a 350 word mantra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The problems, ne uh, the problems never really go away. They just change in their like glamorousness. Right, and you get to choose some really great ones, yeah. if you're lucky. <laughs> but there's still problems. <laughs> yeah, right. And finally, uh, journey or destination? 
that I've got to question that dichotomy. <laughs> okay, like, tell me more. What that I you know I I don't accept the distinction. What do I mean by that? I'm not sure what I mean by that. Yeah. Let's just say journey. But I think that there's something of the destination in every moment of the journey. There you go. Oh, join my cult. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oliver, thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank any, you. Anything you'd like to plug to the audience? We will have links to the book, guys. Read it or get it on Audible because um, you uh, read the audiobook. Narrated by me. The yes. book is available all the places you'd expect to buy yep. books. Um, and then at my website, oliverberkman.com, there's more stuff and you can sign up to uh, my email newsletter, which I call The Imperfectionist. Oh, that's nice. It's a good name. Thank you. I love it. All right, thanks, Oliver. Cheers. And thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you later. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.